This happened to me a few years back. One of those things you think only happens in those cheesy campfire stories. I'm the type who likes to think logically, you know? Never believed in that Bigfoot nonsense, no ghosts or creepy crawlies. Turns out, sometimes the world hides surprises. This mess has me second-guessing everything these days. My name's Declan, by the way. Now, I always loved camping. Not in fancy campgrounds, but out on my own. I've got this old RV my buddies make fun of, says it looks like something from a 70s cop show. Hey, who needs fancy when you have freedom, right? This specific trip decided to head for the redwoods in Northern California. Place is just different, those giant trees stretching over you. Had enough of beaches and tourists. I wanted peace and quiet in the shadow of something majestic for a change. Turns out, peace is kinda overrated. See, there's this dirt road running up the coast, supposed to be pretty scenic. Thought it'd be a nice route for a day's drive. Found this turnout after hours. Didn't want to stop on the main road with that old tank of mine. Seemed deep enough into the woods to be just what I was looking for, so I parked up for the night. That's when things got odd. I was fixing a can of soup after sunset, and well, something moved outside the RV. Figured it was one of those small deer they got up there, maybe sniffing at the trash. Then there was this noise. It was like a loud crack, right by the driver's door. Figured a fallen branch. I took a flashlight, pointed it out that side window, and there, they were footprints. Huge things, way bigger than anyone in boots could make. And they trailed off straight into those bushes in front. My skin felt itchy all of a sudden. Okay, maybe a bear wandered too close. Maybe a poacher leaving tracks. My brain was churning all these excuses even though none made a lick of sense. Whatever it was, I stayed inside that RV with every door locked, didn't shut an eye all night. I thought when the sun came up, I'd just drive out of there and forget all about it. Then another problem surfaced. That old clunker wouldn't start. Just coughed and sputtered when I turned the key. I know a fair bit about engines, tried everything. Battery was fine, but not even a spark. Looked out the window and saw them again, even more enormous footprints. This time they circled the RV like something studying it. It wasn't bears, and poachers don't make prints like that. I don't know what to call the fear back then. Too large for fear, maybe. This primal dread like your brain knows there's danger even if it can't comprehend it. I had a good signal on my phone. Tried calling a ranger, just got voicemail. Didn't leave a message saying a monster was circling my RV. They'd have laughed right through the line. There was one small back window no footprints near. Thought, this is gonna sound dumb, but thought about crawling out. I had my pistol with me but there was nowhere to run. It'd be out in those trees in moments. It decided for me in the end. Something smashed into the side of the RV, enough to shake the whole thing. Then, it dragged something over the roof. Sounded like claws scraping metal. Then it was quiet. Too quiet. Took a good ten minutes and a whole lot of cursing at myself before I dared look out the front window. There it was, a bloody smear across the hood. Okay, let's be logical. There was a carcass on the roof. Deer, something too big for any coyote I know to get up there. Footprints were like a man's, way too big but shaped vaguely right. Maybe some hermit lives out here. Didn't explain the engine, though. Or why some crazy hermit is leaving bloody animal parts around and stalking someone through the woods. Maybe some other nut job on drugs explains a few things. Still, it gave me an excuse to move. I figured this guy, 
whoever he was, wasn't coming back immediately. Gun ready, I scrambled out the back window and took off into the trees. Didn't run long before I spotted the main road. Flagged down the next car that passed. Turns out a few hours later my RV started back up without a problem. No sign of my hermit though. Drove out of there as fast as I could manage. Never turned back toward that road since. You'll think I'm nuts, but there are things reported up there. Vanishing hikers, those big weird prints folks sometimes find. Hell, you know those Bigfoot nuts always rave about that stretch of coastline? Me? I'm staying where the lights are brighter, and there's a whole lot of people nearby. Some secrets, they're meant to stay secret. My name is Jacob Willis and this happened to me in October of 1994. I've spent the past few decades of my career as a park ranger at Yellowstone National Park. Don't get me wrong, this is a dream job. The scenery is incredible, the wildlife fascinating, it never gets old. I love this job. Or at least I did until that day. The call came in on a crisp fall morning. A group of hikers had gone missing on a remote trail near the park's southeastern border. No big deal, right? People get lost sometimes, but my partner and I were the most experienced rangers on staff, so dispatch sent us out. We arrived at the trailhead and began our search. We found some tracks which we presumed belonged to the three missing hikers. At first, everything seemed strangely normal. That's the thing about this place. Yellowstone can lull you into a false sense of security, make you forget the dangers that lurk in its depths. We tracked the hikers for about two miles. The path wound through the forest, and with the trees so close together, sunlight barely filtered down through the leaves. Still, it was easy hiking. The ground sloped gently downhill. We moved fast hoping to catch up quickly. That's when we found it. Or, more precisely, the remains of it. The body was mangled torn and twisted in a way that no human should be capable of contorting. It was mostly skeletal, devoid of most of its flesh. The little that was left hanging on the bones was pale and pulpy, glistening wetly in the dim forest light. My brain tried to make sense of it. An animal attack? Maybe a grizzly, although attacks that vicious are rare. But the way the bones were broken, the angles of the fractures, something wasn't adding up. Mark, you seeing this? I asked, my voice barely a rasp. My partner stood stock still beside me, his face deathly pale. Tracks, he muttered, pointing towards a patch of disturbed earth. Those weren't here before. We followed them, guns drawn. The dense woods made visibility near impossible. The tracks led deeper into the forest, and as we went, the sense of unease grew into a full-blown knot of dread in the pit of my stomach. Then we heard it. A low, guttural growl from somewhere ahead of us. It echoed unnaturally off the trees, reverberating through the woods, seeming to surround us. Slowly, carefully, we pressed forward, the undergrowth crunching under our boots. The growl came again, closer this time, followed by a sickening ripping sound and a sharp scream, cut off abruptly. Adrenaline surged through my veins. I motioned to Mark, indicating we should split up and flank whatever was ahead. He nodded grimly, then melted off into the shadows on my left. The trees thinned out just a bit as I advanced cautiously. Just enough, though, to catch a flash of motion, something large, moving inhumanly fast through the dim forest light. It reappeared ahead of me, bursting into view only ten yards away. My mind reeled at the sight of it. The creature was tall, 
at least eight feet from my estimate, and impossibly thin, with sinewy limbs bent at strange, grotesque angles. Its flesh was a mottled gray, tough and leathery-looking, stretched like old parchment over protruding bones. Its head, that's what haunts me still. It was mostly skull, with yellowed, jagged teeth bared in a perpetual snarl. But the eyes, those eyes were like burning coals, glowing with malevolent intelligence. It lunged at me, and my gun went off once, twice. The creature shrieked in rage and pain, then retreated back into the shadows. I fumbled for fresh rounds, hands slick with sweat. Mark! I shouted, dread rising in my throat. Mark, where are you? There was a pause, then a choked, gurgling sound from off to my left, followed by the sickening squelch of flesh and bone. Bow rose in my throat, and I fought the urge to vomit. I didn't want to find him. I didn't want to see how that thing had gotten him. But my feet carried me, stumbling, crashing blindly through the undergrowth towards the sounds. Then I saw him, his body slumped against a tree. No, not the whole body. Just pieces. My stomach lurched, and I emptied what little was in it onto the forest floor. I needed to get out. To run. To escape. Yet, a strange resolve hardened within me. It had my partner, and God knows what it did to those hikers. I couldn't let this creature, whatever it was, kill again. Gathering my remaining courage, I pressed forward, following the trail of blood and gore. Soon, the woods began to slope upwards, and I knew I was getting closer to the source of, of all this. The trees thinned out, revealing a clearing just ahead. And in the center of that clearing, well, I can't describe it. Can't find the words to form the image. But what I saw in the center of that blood-soaked clearing would give anyone nightmares for a lifetime. The skeletal remnants of the hikers, along with others. It was like a twisted trophy case, only with human bodies. Something shifted in the shadows at the far end of the clearing. The creature emerged, dragging Mark's mangled remains with it. It dropped his body unceremoniously on the growing pile. Then it turned towards me. The burning eyes locked onto mine, and I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that I was next. I raised my gun. I fired, emptying the magazine, shot after useless shot. It barely seemed to slow the creature down. It charged, its guttural snarl echoing through the clearing. The last thing I remember is the flash of those yellowed teeth, and then darkness. I don't know how long I drifted in that void. Hours? Days? Each beat of my heart echoed in the silence, a painful reminder that I was still alive, still trapped in this waking nightmare. Suddenly, I jolted upright, gasping for air. My body throbbed with pain, and my mind raced, trying to piece together the horrifying blur. I was in the clearing, the twisted trophy of bones gleaming under the weak morning sun. But the creature was gone, disappeared without a trace. I stumbled to my feet, surveying the grotesque scene. There was no sign of Mark just a smear of blood where he'd fallen. My stomach turned, but I forced myself to move, to think. I needed to get out, to get help. But as I stumbled towards the edge of the clearing, something caught my eye. Carved into a large, smooth rock near the tree line were symbols, crude, jagged shapes, etched deeply into the stone. They seemed primitive, ancient, a primal fear twisted my gut as I realized what I was looking at, a warning. Or maybe a claim. I stumbled through the forest, a mix of pain, exhaustion, and pure terror fueling me onward. Branches whipped at my face, tearing into my already ragged clothes. Fear kept my pace frantic. 
I didn't dare look back. Hours passed, or perhaps only minutes. Time warped and twisted in the oppressive weight of what I'd witnessed. Finally, I burst from the tree lean, collapsing near a dirt track. A flicker of hope sparked within me, the trail. I pushed myself to my knees and crawled, every movement in agony. Fortune, it seemed, wasn't completely done with me yet. A pickup truck appeared, bouncing slowly down the trail. My heart leapt. I fumbled for my service pistol, firing a shot into the air. The truck shuddered to a halt, and a man with a thick beard and weathered face emerged. His eyes widened in shock at the sight of me. I managed a weak, help please, before blackness enveloped me once more. I woke up in a hospital bed days later, IVs dripping fluids into my arm, the smell of antiseptic hanging heavy in the air. Two sheriff's deputies stood at the foot of my bed, notebooks in hand. They were eager for a statement. My words tumbled out in a disjointed rush as I tried to explain what had happened, the missing hikers, the creature, the gruesome clearing. Their expressions hardened from concern to skepticism. I saw it in their eyes, the disbelief. They didn't think I was lying, exactly, but shock, trauma, it twists things in the retelling. I was discharged a few weeks later, battered but alive. The sheriff's department officially ruled the deaths of the hikers and Mark as a grisly attack, despite my protests. No one believed my claims about a monstrous creature. They chalked it up to a hallucination, a mental break caused by the stress. My colleagues gave me awkward hugs and sympathetic looks, but the unspoken doubt hung between us. News of the bear attack made it into the local papers but never the national ones. Those deaths faded from the public consciousness, a forgotten tragedy in a vast park. But for me, it was impossible to forget. I was never the same afterward. The creature became an obsession, a lurking shadow in my mind. I devoted myself to researching local lore, indigenous legends, anything that might offer a shred of insight into what I'd encountered. There were fragments, similar stories dating back centuries, always hushed up, always explained away. But no answers. No closure. They put me on administrative leave, then quietly offered me early retirement. I took it. I left Yellowstone, leaving a gaping hole in a life once so full. It was a necessary escape, even if I couldn't fully flee the horror that followed me. Years passed, filled with restless nights and an unshakable feeling of being watched. I moved frequently, never staying in one place too long. Out there, somewhere, it still lurked, I was sure of it. And maybe, in some sick way, it was waiting for me. The dreams were the worst. Not nightmares, exactly, but memories twisted and distorted into a grotesque mockery. Mark's mangled body, the skeletal pile in the clearing, the creature's blazing eyes burning into mine over and over. I started to drink, hard. It didn't erase the images, but it dulled the terror, if only for a few hours each night. It was a self-destructive spiral I couldn't escape. One rainy night, on a forgotten highway in rural Montana, I lost control of my truck and slammed into a tree. I was drunk, of course. It should have killed me. The paramedics who dragged me from the wreckage said I was lucky to be alive. Maybe. Because when I woke up in that sterile hospital room, something had changed. The creature, the lurking fear that had tormented me for decades, it was gone. Replaced by a chilling emptiness. I didn't know if this was relief, or something far worse. That was how it ended. Not in a blaze of glory, not even a final confrontation. Just a pathetic whimper. I live in a rundown motel now, 
working odd jobs under the table, cash only. I drink less these days. No point, really. The thing in Yellowstone broke me. Shattered something vital inside me that may never heal. Some might call my survival a kind of victory. I don't know. It doesn't feel like it. My name's Ethan Price. Been with the agency for longer than I care to admit. Worked counterterrorism mostly, the kind of stuff that gives you ulcers and keeps you up at night. But this mission back in 2014, it was different. Worse, somehow. They sent me to investigate a cluster of disappearances along the main coast. Small towns, fishing communities, the kind of places where everyone knows your business. At first, it seemed like typical backwoods stuff, runaways, petty feuds spun out of control. But there were whispers, stories locals told with their voices low, about something out there in the fog. They figured I'd smooth things over, offer vague government reassurances. Instead, I found something far more terrifying than any conspiracy theory. The first body they pulled from the sea. I wish I could forget it. It looked like it had been caught in a giant fishing net, skin shredded and bleached in unnatural white. Half the face was just gone, like something had knotted off with sickening precision. The locals muttered the old name, the one spoken only behind closed doors. The Riptide Walker. Some kind of folklore, a boogeyman to explain away the tragedies of the ocean. Only, I'd seen enough to know that sometimes the monsters are more real than we want to believe. I requested support, got it after a bureaucratic tangle that made me want to pull my hair out. A small team, marine biologists, tacticians. We set up base in an abandoned lighthouse, the perfect place to watch the churning gray sea. I spent those first nights on the balcony when whipping at my face, straining to see shapes in the fog. It plays tricks on your mind, that endless expanse of gray. The team was on edge but professional. That changed when Harris didn't come back from his night patrol. We found him near dawn, washed up on the rocks. His body was mangled, but far more disturbing was the expression frozen on his face, stark, wide-eyed terror. One of the biologists, a woman named Dr. Ellis, pointed out the lack of blood around his remains. Most wounds would bleed profusely. These looked surgically clean. That's when the true horror of what we faced started to crystallize. This wasn't a mindless predator. It was calculating methodical. We laid a trap. Used ourselves as bait. I hated the idea sacrificing my team, but it was the only chance of catching this thing. Nights on that windswept balcony became an agonizing vigil. Then, one foggy morning, it appeared. Emerging from the mist, it was far taller than a man, hunched over on spindly limbs. Its skin was translucent, slick like a fish belly, revealing a disturbingly intricate skeletal structure. The head was... I still struggled to describe it. Bulbous, tapered, with a lipless mouth that opened sideways, full of needle-like teeth. Its eyes were lidless, milky white orbs that seemed to fixate on us with dispassionate intelligence. The team opened fire. Bullets tore through its flesh, punching fist-sized holes, but it kept moving. It shrieked, a sound like fingernails on a chalkboard and threw itself into the sea with unnatural speed. We never got a clean shot, and just like that, it vanished back into the fog. In the aftermath, I found Dr. Ellis sitting alone staring out at the ocean. She was the only one who truly understood what we'd encountered. We talked for hours, theorizing. Some kind of deep-sea creature, 
forced to the surface by changing ecosystems, or some genetic experiment gone hideously wrong. Yet it seemed too intelligent, too focused for any of those explanations. Official report went down as Animal attack? Of course. They buried Harris quietly, dismissed us. I stuck around those coastal towns for a while, trying to find more victims, more clues. There was nothing. The riptide walker, whatever it was, had retreated back to its watery domain, leaving nothing but unanswered questions and a lingering sense of dread. Years later, I still dream of that pale, tapered face. The milky eyes. Some cases stay with you, seep into your bones. I left the agency not long after Maine. Worked as a private investigator for a bit, but the shadows felt a little too long, a little too filled with unseen shapes. Now, I teach self-defense classes to jittery suburban moms. It's safer, quieter. But sometimes, when the wind howls just right, and the fog rolls in, I remember that lighthouse, the churning sea, and the knowledge that the world is far stranger and far darker than we suspect. This happened to me a few years ago. I didn't like to leave my house. Now I'm more open to hiking or spending time in nature. If you ask, I'll talk about it. My name is Killian. Before all this happened, I always loved the peace of the forest. On weekends, I left behind the busy city for the solitude of the woods near my home. Just south of Asheville, a sprawling network of trails weaves through the North Carolina mountains. One crisp fall morning, I set off alone. The early sun barely poked through the heavy canopy of leaves. My hiking boots crunched over fallen twigs. I breathed deeply, savoring the scent of the damp earth beneath my feet. Every so often, I paused to watch the play of sunlight through the branches overhead. The woods were my sanctuary. Or so I thought. I came to a familiar clearing. A single massive oak dominated the space its gnarled roots poking through the earth like fingers grasping at the sky. I always took a moment here before continuing on the trail. Something was different. Silence. It wasn't the comforting silence of the forest, but a thick, oppressive hush. The birds had fallen quiet. Even the gentle rustling of leaves in the wind had ceased. I felt uneasy the hair on the back of my neck prickling. Then I heard it. A low growl, echoing from the trees beyond the clearing. My heart pounded in my chest. I froze. My mind raced, trying to pinpoint the source of the sound. A bear? I'd seen them around here before but never this close to the main trails. Another growl, louder this time. It didn't sound quite like a bear. Deeper, more guttural. It was definitely close now. I whirled, scanning the dense underbrush. My hands shook as I fumbled for my pocket knife, the small blade utterly useless against whatever creature lurked in the shadows. It stepped into the sunlight from behind a thick stand of pines. I'd never seen anything like it. Taller than a man by far, it moved on two legs. Long, Powerful arms hung at its sides, ending in huge clawed hands. It was covered in thick, matted fur, dark gray-brown. Its eyes burned into me from the depths of a long muzzle filled with sharp, yellow teeth. The creature was all muscle. There was no doubt, it was a predator. I had heard the stories, of course. Tales of upright, Wolf-like creatures lurking in the deepest woods went around these parts. I'd dismiss them as tall tales, stories to spook kids around the campfire. But now I knew those tales were rooted in something far more terrifying. Every instinct screamed at me to run. But my legs refused to move. 
I was rooted to the spot, fear keeping me paralyzed. The creature took a tentative step towards me, its head cocked to one side as it studied me. I saw intelligence in those eyes, a cold calculation that made my blood run cold. It lunged. I barely had time to react before its sharp claws were raking down my chest, tearing into the fabric of my jacket. Pain erupted in my torso and I stumbled back, gasping for breath. The creature howled in frustration, its eyes burning with bloodlust. My fear dissolved into desperate resolve. I couldn't stay here. I had to run. Blindly, I turned and bolted for the trees. I didn't look back. I sprinted through the woods, branches whipping at my face, my ragged breath burning in my lungs. Every sound of snapping twigs or rustling leaves made me jump in terror, certain that any moment the creature would be upon me. I ran until my legs could carry me no longer. I collapsed behind a fallen log, panting and shaking. For a long while, I didn't move. All I could do was listen intently, my entire body poised for flight. Slowly, I realized the sounds of the forest had returned. The wind rustled through the trees. Birds sang their songs once more. Still, I waited and waited. I rose cautiously, my body aching with scrapes and bruises. I crept back towards the clearing where my ordeal had begun. My hiking pack was strewn about, its contents scattered across the forest floor. The creature was nowhere in sight. Relief and fear warred within me. I knew I was lucky. I'd escaped with nothing more than some scratches and a story that nobody would likely believe. I never saw the creature again. I still hike those trails, but I do so with a wary eye and a faster pace. It's hard to fully return to that feeling of tranquility in the woods. The knowledge that something lurks there always lingers around the edges of my mind. This happened to me on September 16, 1991. I always thought solitude was its own kind of superpower. Turns out, it can make you a damn easy target. Name's Everett. Everett Miles. Used to work in finance, had the whole city slicker routine down until it nearly ate me alive. That's why I bought myself a slice of wilderness in the Pacific Northwest dense forest, a babbling creek, further from another living soul than I'd ever been. My first few months out there were bliss. Quiet nights, air so clean it made your lungs ache in the best way. Taught myself the basics, foraging, fixing up the old cabin, all that. It was hard work, sure, but satisfying in a way spreadsheets and boardrooms never were. Then came the day I wasn't alone anymore. Didn't see anyone, exactly. But I saw the signs. A footprint near the creek, massive, misshapen. A not open food cache in the shed, no critter I recognized responsible. I told myself it was a bear, maybe some old, deformed one. Piled rocks around my supplies, doubled down on clearing any brush near the cabin. Things only got worse. I woke one night to a low, bone-shaking growl right outside my window. Threw on the floodlight side rigged up. Nothing. Still, the sound sent shivers down my spine. After that, the feeling of eyes on me was constant. It wasn't my imagination, I knew it. I started keeping the rifle loaded, even when I slept. Days blurred together. Hike the perimeter, check the snares, reinforce the cabin, eat, lie awake listening to every rustle in the darkness. I hadn't spoken aloud to another person in weeks. One afternoon, I was chopping firewood when I heard it, the same damn growl, louder this time. It ripped through the still air, echoing off the hillsides. 
I froze, axe mid-swing, heart pounding in my ears. That's when I caught a flash of movement on the tree lean. A hulking shape, half hidden by the shadows. It stood upright, like a person, but huge, easily seven feet tall. Its fur was patchy and dark, and its eyes, even at that distance, glowed an unnatural yellow in the sunlight. I fumbled with the axe, trying to remember how the hell I'd even gotten myself into this situation. Before I could make a move, it was gone, vanished back into the trees. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I sat at my window, rifle in my lap, staring out into the darkness. Part of me wanted to pack up everything and run for it, but a stronger part wouldn't let me. This was my land, my home. I wasn't giving it up without a fight. The next few days passed in a tense haze. I set traps near where I'd spotted the creature, heavy-duty ones meant for wild boar. They went untouched. The forest seemed to hold its breath, waiting. Then came the morning I found the body. It was Mike, a logger from a town an hour's drive away. Used to drop off supplies sometimes, just enough interaction to keep me from going completely feral. He lay sprawled by the creek, his face torn, his clothes shredded. The sight made me heave until I had nothing left inside. I knew then it was over. Whatever was out there wasn't just some animal. It was a hunter, and it had picked me as its next target. I buried Mike as best I could under a pile of stones. Didn't know if it was for respect or to try and hide the body, but it felt like the right thing to do. Then I started packing. Took essentials only. Rifle, ammunition, food, compass, the works. Left the cabin unlocked. Most of my belongings behind. Didn't figure I'd be coming back, and it didn't feel right to leave my stuff for whatever that thing was to claim as a trophy. I hiked out under cover of darkness, following the winding logging roads I knew by heart. Each creak of the trees, each rustle in the underbrush, made me jump. But I kept going. Got picked up by a trucker just after dawn. He eyed me strangely, but I was past caring. Babbled about needing to get to the city, to the police. He took me as far as Seattle, dropped me off at some crowded bus station. Bought a new identity, a burner phone, all with the cash I'd stashed away. Found myself a grimy apartment in the heart of downtown. Surrounded by people and traffic and noise a million miles from that quiet cabin and the shadow trees. They never found the thing, of course. Old loner ranting about monsters wasn't exactly a priority. Still, some nights, I hear those growls again, echoing not in the woods but in my own damn head. Makes me wonder if part of me is still back there, crouched by the window, watching the tree line. Wonder if the creature is watching too, waiting for me to slip up, to come home. Maybe they call it the skin crawler, or some other scary-sounding name. Maybe the locals whisper about it over beers and campfires, another legend to spook themselves with. Doesn't matter what it's called. I know what it is. And I know that even surrounded by concrete and cars, I'll never truly be safe from it again. This happened to me on October 3rd, 1999. The year the world was supposed to end, or so everyone joked. Figured it was as good a time as any to chuck city life. So, I bought a chunk of land in the Ozarks. Call me Randall, Randall Barnes. Used to be an accountant, then I wasn't. My spread sat deep in the woods, a tumble-down cabin perched on a ridge, Nothing but pines and hollers for miles around. Figured the quiet would do me good, unravel some of the stress knots in my gut. First few months, it was heaven. 
fixing up the cabin, hiking, getting my hands dirty in a way they hadn't since I was a kid. Turns out, isolation can be addictive. Things began to change around the first frost. Wasn't a sudden shift, more like a sourness seeping into the air. Found myself restless at night, couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. One crisp afternoon, I was chopping firewood when I heard it, a howl that cut straight to the bone. Not a wolf, not a coyote. It rose and fell, echoing eerily, like a lament. Sent a shiver down my spine. Figured it was just my overactive imagination, playing tricks in the silence. But over the next few weeks, the sounds grew closer. Deep, rumbling growls from just beyond the tree line. Scraping sounds on the cabin walls at night. And worst of all, the smell. A musky, rotten odor that clung to the air long after the noises faded. Then came the tracks. The first time I saw them, my blood ran cold. They circled my woodpile, massive paw prints sunk deep into the mud, claws as long as my fingers. My old hunting rifle started looking real appealing, even if I didn't know what the hell I was dealing with. Winter set in hard that year. An ice storm rattled the windows, making the cabin feel flimsy, exposed. I huddled by the stove, rifle across my lap, heart pounding with every creak and rustle from the woods outside. One night, I was awoken by a bone-rattling thud against the wall. I bolted upright. The growling was right outside, louder than ever, laced with a hungry fury. It slammed against the cabin again and again, the wood groaning in protest. I snatched the rifle, hands shaking, and fired through the window at the darkness. It let out a startled yelp, then there was nothing but silence. I hunkered down, didn't sleep a wink. At dawn, I cautiously went outside. Snow coated the ground, unmarked but for the blood stains near the window. I followed the blood trail a little ways, and then I saw the carcass. It had been a deer, its throat ripped out. But the way it was mangled, I'd never seen anything like it. Huge chunks were missing, nod to the bone, and its hind leg was twisted askew at an unnatural angle. Suddenly, the hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. I whirled around. There, half obscured in the shadows, was the biggest damn wolf I'd ever laid eyes on. Its fur was patchy, its snout elongated, and its eyes, they burned yellow, full of a predatory intelligence that made my stomach churn. It took a menacing step towards me, let out a low growl. I raised the rifle, squeezed the trigger. The sound cracked through the frozen air, but the wolf was gone, vanished like a specter. Knew right then I wasn't going to last. I packed essentials, snowshoes, everything I could carry. Didn't even look back at the cabin as I trekked out towards the main road. I hitched a ride to the nearest town. Told no one my story. They'd have locked me up for sure. Just bought a bus ticket and headed east, as far away from those woods as I could get. Months later, I saw a story in the paper about a missing hiker in the Ozarks. His campsite shredded, bones picked clean and the description of those massive footprints matched the ones I'd seen. Some nights, I think I still hear those howls cutting through the rumble of city traffic. Think I see a flash of yellow eyes in the headlights of passing cars. Makes me wonder, did whatever lives out there follow me? Or is it just waiting out in the woods, growing bolder, hungrier, biding its time? The locals, they talk about the Ozark Howler, some kind of beast from their folk tales. I don't know what to believe, except that there are things in this world that don't fit on any map, things that hunt in the shadows. And sometimes they find you.
This happened to me on February 23, 1997. Name's Terry, and I work search and rescue up in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. Always loved the outdoors, ever since I was a kid. Dad took me fishing, camping. Figured this job was the perfect mix of what I love and doing some good in the world. Funny how that outlook changes. I got called out for a missing camper, a young guy named Bryce. Apparently, he'd been planning an ambitious solo overnight hike, a tough trail known for steep drop-offs and unpredictable weather. He'd texted his girlfriend once he reached his starting point and then gone radio silent. She got worried, called it in. Can't say I blame her. Those woods, they get lonely fast. I hiked the first part of the trail without seeing anything amiss. Typical Pacific Northwest stuff, towering trees, a carpet of ferns, that crisp smell of pine. Made a joke over the radio about finding Bigfoot instead of Bryce, just to lighten the mood. Rangers on the line didn't crack a smile. That should have been my first clue that something was off. Late afternoon, I reached an overlook where Bryce had planned to camp. No sign of him or a tent, but I did see something disturbing. There was a deer carcass, or at least part of one. Its flesh had been picked clean, but not in the way a bear or coyote would do it. These were surgical cuts, the bones bare as if something had carefully stripped them. My stomach lurched, but I tried to rationalize. Maybe a hunter had left this and a scavenger got to the rest? I pushed down the prickle of unease. Then I heard a noise above me, like a dry cough. I looked up, half expecting to see a buzzard circling. What I saw made the blood freeze in my veins. Clinging to a tree branch at an impossible angle was a thing. It looked vaguely human, but impossibly tall and skeletal. Its skin hung loose over protruding bones, giving it a mummified look. Its head was large, the features sunken, except for its eyes. Those shone with a predatory yellow gleam. I'll never forget that hungry stare. It dropped down soundlessly landing in front of me. My heart was pounding so loud in my ears, I swore the thing could hear it. I fumbled for my pistol and fired off a warning shot, more out of desperation than strategy. The creature didn't even flinch. It hissed, a rattling, rasping sound that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Then it lunged. I barely scrambled back the thing's claws swiping the air where I'd just been. My mind was racing, trying to process what the hell was happening. Animal attack? Psychotic hermit off his meds? Something else? I didn't have time to figure it out. Survival instinct took over. I took off running, the thing bounding after me with inhuman speed. Panic fueled me, but I could hear it gaining its ragged breathing mingling with the thud of my own pulse. I stumbled and fell, my ankle twisting with a sickening crack. Pain shot through me, hot and blinding. I forced myself to keep crawling, dragging my useless leg behind me. The creature reached me, its stink, decay mixed with an acrid, metallic tang, washing over me. It circled, its talons scraping the dirt. For a terrible, heart-stopping moment, I thought it was toying with me like a cat with a mouse. Then it leaned down, its distended jaw opening wide, revealing rows of needle-sharp teeth. I closed my eyes, then heard a shout and a gunshot. The creature yelped, a wet, gurgling sound. I dared to open my eyes and saw Bryce standing over me, his hiking rifle raised. He fired again and the thing shrieked, leaping back into the trees with a flurry of snapping branches. Bryce knelt beside me, face pale but determined. He helped me get back to the ranger station. I got patched up, and they found the remains of Bryce's campsite, 
his tent shredded, his gears strewn all around in the same, unnervingly precise way I'd seen with the deer. Bryce, shaken to his core, swore up and down he'd been off exploring a side trail when he heard my gunshot and came running. The whole thing got hushed up. Bear attack with hiker self-defense was the official line. I know damn well it wasn't a bear. Bryce, sometimes I catch him looking at me like we're the only two people in the world who share a terrible, unspeakable secret. I think we both saw something in the other's eyes that day, some kind of primal understanding about how fragile life is, how thin the line between the world we know and something else. The folks at the station treated me like a hero. Bryce and his girlfriend were endlessly grateful. But the nightmares started soon after. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the creature's rasping breath hot on my neck, those yellow eyes burning into me in the darkness. Wasn't long before I was drinking more, just to numb the fear enough to get a few hours of sleep. My wife, bless her heart, she tried her best to be understanding, but the strain got to be too much. Marriage fell apart, and it's hard to blame her. I was turning into a ghost, haunted by the day in those woods. I put in for a transfer, went to a smaller district down in California, redwoods instead of pines, but the quiet felt the same. Still do search and rescue, I just stick to the well-worn trails now. Don't get as many call-outs, not so many folks go missing in the sunny parts. Sometimes that's a blessing. Whatever it was, it's still out there. The rangers tell me there's been weird sightings up in those woods for years, old local legends about a stick man, a creature of hunger and bone that stalks the deep wilderness. My dad always said, The woods themselves, they don't care if you live or die. Now I understand exactly what he meant. A few years back, I took a solo trip down to the Everglades. Been a nature buff all my life, drawn to those wild, untouched places. Me, my cameras, and the open wilderness, what could be better than that? My folks weren't too thrilled about it, but I'm Kellen, twenty-something and itching to prove myself. Everglades ain't like your usual national park. You get that raw swamp feeling out their muggy air, a zillion creepy crawlies, and those gnarled cypress trees dripping with moss. There were gators, sure, those you kinda expected, big and slow-moving in the sunlight. But it was the sense of something bigger, something unseen, that played on my mind. On the second day, ventured off the marked trails, wanting to get those truly untouched shots. Followed a winding side channel deeper into the swamp, the water black and still. Saw a flash of bright feathers, an anhinga bird or something, and followed it deeper, branches whipping against me as I went. The bird took flight, making a mournful cry, and I was left in the thick of it. It was like all sound had been swallowed by the trees. Then came the smell rotting meat mixed with something sickly sweet. My stomach twisted. That's when I found it not the bird, something else. A body half-submerged in the mud, clothes torn to shreds. The skin was pale, almost translucent, like the thing had been underwater for a week. I won't lie, I almost puked. But I'm stubborn, always have been. Snap some photos from a distance— Figuring if the police found the body, they might want this. The rest of that day was a blur. Hiked back, barely looking where I was going. Part of me felt like I should go to a ranger station, report what I found. Another, louder, part of me whispered to keep it secret. After all, I was in his territory now, wasn't I? Managed to find my rented boat stashed by the water's edge got in, hands shaking as I fumbled with the oars. 
That's when I saw the handprints, smeared in blood across the boat where I tied it up. And those weren't human prints too long, too narrow, like talons had dragged across the wood. Paddled like a man-man back to my cabin. Didn't sleep much, just listened to the sounds of the swamp at night, every rustle setting my teeth on edge. Every time I saw a shadow flicker at the window, I jumped, convinced it was coming for me. Morning brought some clarity. Or maybe it was the desperation clawing at the back of my throat. Whatever it was, I knew I was getting out of there. Packed my gear fast, tossed it onto the boat. There was only one way out as far as I could tell, following the main channels back towards civilization. I figured it wouldn't follow me in broad daylight. Figured wrong. Maybe a half hour in, I heard it, the crack of a branch behind me. Whipped my head around, heart pounding. The thing was tall, too tall for a person, and gangly thin. The skin hung loose on its bones like melted wax. But the worst was its head, small for that big body, and the face seemed stretched too long. The black eyes were pits, staring right through me. It let out a howl that sent chills down my spine. Not an animal sound, more like a shriek twisted wrong. I shoved off the bank, rowing until my arms burned. That thing was gaining, moving through the trees with impossible speed. I fired off a shot from my dad's old hunting rifle, more to scare it than anything didn't even slow it down. Up ahead, a fallen tree blocked the channel. I aimed the boat towards it, leapt out last minute, hauling myself up onto the slick trunk. The boat crunched to a stop and it lunged after me, its clawed hands barely missing my heel as I scrambled away. I ran until I thought my lungs would burst. Lost the rifle somewhere back there, didn't care. Eventually stumbled out onto a proper road, nearly getting myself flattened by a startled pickup truck driver. The sheriff didn't believe me, not at first. Thought I was some hopped-up tourist who'd gotten lost. Then I showed him the photos. His face paled when he saw the body. Told him what else I'd seen out there, and his jaw set in a hard line. Never found out what happened to the body. No reports of a missing person matching what I'd found, not officially at least. Sheriff reckoned there were folks who disappeared out there sometimes, their bodies never recovered. After that, he listened to me though, nodded like maybe he knew more than he was letting on. Turns out, those old stories about things lurking in the swamp, they aren't always just for scaring kids. They told me to keep quiet, not to make a fuss. Said it would be bad for tourism, bad for the town. Part of me understands that. But another part, the part that still sees those black eyes in my nightmares and knows what's out there. Knows it's still hungry. My name doesn't matter much anymore. But if anyone comes out to the Everglades, maybe remember my story. Know that some places, you're not at the top of the food chain and the old legends whispered about the Wendigo. Sometimes those legends are teeth and claws in the dark. A couple years back, I went hiking. That's not much of a hook, I know. Single guy in my thirties, works in accounting, doesn't sound like a thriller movie or anything. But I assure you, the hike did not go as planned. See, most weekends the extent of my adventure is trying a new takeout spot near my apartment. That weekend, a buddy dared me to join him up in the Olympic National Forest in Washington State. It's rugged country, full of thick green trees, mountains. Gorgeous, really? I even took some cheesy vacation photos to prove it. We'd planned a three-day trek with overnight camping. Nothing hardcore, mind you. 
I figured getting into nature would do me good. Day one on the trail was tough, I won't lie. My pack felt like a ton of bricks, and my legs screamed murder. Still, the views made the slog worth it. Night came, we set up camp in a clear space by a gurgling stream. My friend, Derek, made campfires too, I cracked open a beer. Perfect night, honestly. Jokes, stars, maybe I was even starting to unwind. The next morning, I woke before Derek. It was early, the forest still draped in misty half-light. Needed to use the bathroom, the usual. I figured a good way off behind some brush would do the trick. Now, remember those trees I mentioned? Big ones, close together, especially further from the main trail. I didn't venture all that far, but as I was taking care of my business, I heard a crack behind me. Not like a twig breaking, mind you. Louder, deeper. I whipped my head around and that's when I saw it. A massive figure standing stock still at the edge of a thicket. Not fully clear, shadows played tricks. At first, I thought maybe it was a bear reared up. Wrong shape, though. I couldn't even describe it at the time. Tall, lanky, but too muscular for a deer. The head, the head was all off. The way it hung low on the shoulders, elongated somehow. Frozen, I didn't breathe for what felt like a century. That thing didn't move an inch. Suddenly, from behind me, there was a crash in the foliage. I yelled, jumped. It was just Derek, blurry-eyed and stumbling as he zipped up his tent flap. You all right, man? he asked, blinking slowly. At that, the shape seemed to melt into the woods. There was no rustle of leaves, no heavy footfalls, just gone. Cold chills shot up my spine. There? Derek said, rubbing his beard. Cougar, maybe? My voice rasped out. Don't think so. Derek tilted his head. Well, whatever it was, it doesn't seem to be nearby now. Should we pack up? I hesitated, my eyes scanning the undergrowth, but he had a point. Logic said if something dangerous was around, we'd likely know by now. The morning air bit through me, bringing a shiver. Not so much from fear, but... I can't fully explain it. Something about that thing felt old, and deep, and wrong in a way I'd never encountered. Still... My stupid pride told me we shouldn't abandon the whole trip. Besides, I didn't have a great description of the creature, if it was a creature. How convincing would I sound to Derek? As we hiked, it wasn't fear that made the forest heavy. It was something like dread. An unease that settled into my bones. By evening, I convinced myself I saw shadows lurking at the edge of the campfire's glow. Sleep proved impossible, filled with nightmares of gnarled limbs and burning eyes. The thing just felt like it was, watching, waiting. On the third day, I broke. Didn't matter if Derek thought I was an idiot. I told him it was either we hiked double time or I didn't go another step. Bless him, he didn't question me. Just packed up quick and set a brisk pace towards the park entrance. We both barely spoke, we knew. No animal acts that way. We didn't slow down once we reached the trailhead. I hopped in my car and blasted the heat with trembling hands. Didn't think Derek believed my whole story. It made little sense out loud. Just kept shaking his head, saying it was stress. I'd imagine things. Maybe he was right. I started losing sleep again back home, plagued by that unsettling feeling. One morning, in desperation, I started typing my experience into a search bar. I didn't put much stock in those cryptid sightings online, but I was out of options. That's how I found the stories about skinwalkers. Those Navajo legends, 
with creatures mimicking sounds, stalking under cover of darkness. The description seemed to fit what I saw, or mostly so. My head spun, fear twisting my guts. It could just be an odd trick of nature, yeah? Still, something keeps me off those hiking trails these days. I get my fresh air on a treadmill in my apartment gym. The beer doesn't taste as good, but hey, I'm here to tell the tale. It took weeks before the nightmares receded. Months before I told anyone else. It's easier if they think I'm nuts. And I haven't forgotten. Some dark corner of my mind reminds me constantly. We weren't the only ones in the woods those days. That thing's still out there. I always thought the long and empty stretches of Nevada highways were mesmerizing in a desolate kind of way. My name is Barrett Sloan, and for the past decade, I've threaded my big rig through these veins of the desert like a steel-blooded giant. Late into what should have been night, under a sky unspoiled by city lights, I'd be driving supplies to out-of-the-way diners and gas stations that most maps forgot to mention. That particular twilight felt different, though. The air hung static over the cracked asphalt of Route 375, also known as Extraterrestrial Highway. Roswell's got nothing on this stretch when it comes to alien lore, but I never bought into tales about UFOs or spooks in the desert. I simply loved driving, breath taken by the landscape that rolled out like a canvas of sands and secrets. I was en route to Warm Springs, a near phantom town if ever there was one. The shipment was routine, canned goods, bottled water, essentials. Folks there didn't ask for much and rarely had stories to tell. They kept to themselves, and I respected that. Warm Springs consisted of not much more than a few weather-beaten houses clutching the earth and an old saloon-turned-makeshift general store where I'd drop off goods. Tonight was supposed to be just another quick stop. But as my headlights cut through the growing twilight, casting long shadows from the Joshua trees that lined the road, I hit something, or someone. It didn't register at first. The thud lost amidst the rumble of diesel power under me. But in my rearview mirror's glow... I saw a figure sprawled across the road, a man in plain clothes stained now with dirt and worse. No car wreck around that could have explained his presence here. Alarmed yet skeptical about what just happened, I pulled over with a sigh toning down my initial shock. The inventory would have to wait. As much as it seemed like a setup for trouble, leaving him there wasn't an option. It's just not in me. Grabbing my flashlight and locking up behind me, I approached cautiously, noting that despite the calamity he must have endured before finding himself in my truck's path, his leather boots looked expensive, out of place for this middle-of-nowhere span of highway. The man didn't stir as I neared him, not dead, but bad off from what I could tell. No question about it. I had to call for help out here where there's little but stars and silence for company on a good day. Just as I reached for my radio clip secure on my belt, another sound grew slowly from behind me, another vehicle approaching fast, the kind that wasn't stopping for anything or anyone. I turned back toward my rig with urgency gripping my steps now more than ever. Options played out quick in my mind about what could be barreling down on us a trafficking transport, or drug runners, maybe. These desert roads can turn you into prey if you're not careful or unlucky enough to stand between someone dangerous and their destination. A glance over my shoulder revealed too late. It wasn't one vehicle but several trucks moving like shadows against the faint light left in the sky. Headlights abruptly snapped off as they drew nearer running silent now except for that relentless growl pushing closer under unseen wheels. I tried to run back to him, the man on the ground, 
to haul him away from whatever was coming next at us full tilt from down that road when something solid struck hard against my back sending sparks across my vision. Impact threw me forward into the dust. I scrambled for cover behind my rig, heart pounding in my ears. The truck circled, trapping me and the man on the ground. Doors flew open, heavy boots hit dirt. A figure stepped out from the lead truck. Tall, broad-shouldered, his face hidden behind a mask marked with strange symbols. He issued orders with swift hand motions. Others heeded, forming a perimeter. I had one chance. I reached for my forgotten radio. The signal was weak this far out, but I pressed the button hard enough to feel it denting my thumb and whispered urgently for backup. Silence filled the channel for what seemed like eternity until a crackle answered, voices promising rapid approach. They found us before help arrived. One grabbed my arm, steel cables for muscles, dragging me away from my intended rescue of the injured stranger. Fists and feet flew. They were not there to talk. Bloodied and bruised, I curled up to protect myself as best I could. Then shots rang out, not from my attackers but from a distance. Flashing lights pierced through darkness as backup arrived, sirens wailing an aggressive battle cry. My assailants scattered like roaches under sudden light, leaving their prey behind. The man, he didn't make it, his injuries too severe or perhaps neglected too long. They questioned me later in Stark Hospital fluorescence but I had no answers about who they were. They acted with military precision, but wore no uniform I recognized. Days passed in dull hospital blues and grays when an officer visited. A name badge reading, Hawkins, caught my eye, as he briefed about similar attacks recently stopped in time. He left me with a hint of an identity of who could execute such horror, a cartel boss known only as El Cuervo a name spoken in hushed tones fraught with fear among those who patrolled roads such as mine. I was back on patrol soon after, not unscathed but resolved that silence would not claim me or mine without a fight. They said my call saved lives that night, small comfort when plagued by phantom pains of those we couldn't save. I never learned why I was targeted or what they wanted with the man whose luck had been worse than mine. Some questions have no answers, or perhaps some are better left unasked. In the quiet that follows chaos there's space to mourn, not just for him or for myself, but for the semblance of peace that once dwelled upon these barren tracks now forever marred by violence witnessed under starlight. Yet life presses forward on inevitable tides. Duty calls each dawn despite Tread's heavy mantle, guiding weary travelers toward morning's light, a silent guardian against threats lurking within and beyond tranquil desert horizons. Ever have one of those moments that make you realize just how mundane your morning coffee routine is? I was about to experience a disturbance to my daily grind that made instant coffee seem thrilling. I work for the U.S. government in a secretive role that involves genetic experiments. Specifically, my tasks are carried out at a facility hidden within the sprawling forests of the Pacific Northwest, so remote that even Google Maps gives up trying to locate it. My name is Mustafa Lemkin and I'm no stranger to the bizarre and unexplainable, but what transpired was unlike anything even my extensive clearance could rationalize. My colleagues, including Joe Vita Keen, an expert in bioinformatics, and Dragan Ruzik, whose skills in molecular genetics were second to none, were with me when we found something particularly unsettling at the edge of our research perimeter. Dragon was examining something half-buried under crimson-soaked leaves, his brow furrowed. Mustafa, you ever see something like this in our work? He asked in his thick Eastern European accent. 
I crouched beside him to see a patterning of flesh and fur mangled in such a way that it resembled avant-garde art if one had a particularly grim taste. This wasn't an accident. It was calculated, dismemberment with precision that was chilling. Pritter war's getting wild out here. Jovita offered dryly from behind us, her attempt at lightening the mood only making the hairs on my neck stand on end. Returning to our lab bunker meant trekking through the thicket where whispers from the wind felt like warning mutters. It was on one such return trip our radio crackled with panic, an assistant from another department reporting sighting something near her station, her last sentence cut off with a scream followed by silence. Cursing under our breaths, guns in hand, government issue for our unexpected wild neighbors— we hurried towards the location she'd described. Our comms were down. We couldn't call for backup or even alert anyone to what was happening. We found her workstation abandoned, papers fluttering into the wilderness like frightened birds taking flight. A trail of destruction led deeper into the woods, broken branches at unnatural heights and footprints unlike any wildlife indigenous to these parts. With each step further from safety, tension craved release and brash decisions yet we moved with purposeful stealth, awareness heightened as though every sense had been sharpened by fear itself. I didn't sign up for fieldwork. Dragon muttered, his words almost a whisper against the backdrop of encroaching darkness. Nobody signs up for this kind of fieldwork. I responded though my voice lacked conviction a joke falling flat as if absorbed by impending dread. The trail ended abruptly before us as we emerged into a clearing illuminated by a natural skylight framed by towering pines. The clearing seemed untouched until I glimpsed something move, fast and fluid in the corner of my eye, a flash of what appeared like amalgamated animal features yet utterly unfamiliar. It had detected us too. Our unseen adversary seemed pervasive, the embodiment of every whispered folklore tale where wild things roam outside men's domain. Yet this was flesh and blood. It bled when Dragon's bullet grazed it after it lunged towards Jovita who had strayed too close to its hidden vantage point. She fell back with a gasp while the creature retreated back into cover. Dragon checked his weapon as I pulled Jovita to her feet. Blood oozed from a gash on her arm where the creature had struck. We were scientists, not combatants, ill-prepared for an assault by an unknown entity in a forest that had turned hostile. Mobile phones showed no service, a dead zone in the wilderness. We need to move, I said, probing our retreat path. Dragon nodded, helping Jovita along as we retraced our steps. The creature could be stalking us. Its dark silhouette was a blur of fur and muscle that could outmaneuver us with ease. The trek back was silent except for our hurried steps and the occasional rustle in the underbrush. We kept our gaze fixed behind us as much as forward, anticipating another attack. As we cleared the densest part of the woods, Dragon's foot caught on something. He fell forward cursing under his breath. A trap, an improvised snare of sorts, had been set up with cunning simplicity. We cut him free but found no sign of our assailant. It was near dawn when we stumbled onto the road where our vehicle waited. We drove straight to the nearest hospital for Jovita's wound and contacted local authorities thereafter. The response was skepticism masked by faint concern. They noted but did not act. Days passed in a blur of medical checks and debriefings with faces that expressed disbelief at our account. Members of our research team departed one after another until solitude became my companion. Jovita moved to a different city. Dragon took indefinite leave from work. The incident left each of us altered, unable to reconcile our reality with what we faced in those woods. Official reports catalogued the encounter under unidentified animal attacks, though nothing like it had ever been documented or even rumored to exist. 
the forest reclaimed its silence as if nothing had ever trespassed upon its tranquility. I found no peace. Sleep gave way to restless nights and work became a distraction that barely managed to hold back the memory of those harrowing moments. But life had to continue. Unanswered questions lingered as whispers among leaves. A language without translation. An experience undocumented yet undeniably real. We never returned to those woods, nor did we speak again of what happened that night. Our scars were remembrance enough. Jovita's wound healed leaving behind faint lines etched into her skin as if nature itself wanted us never to forget our transgression into its domain where something lurked beyond human understanding. That flash of movement remains etched in my recollection a creature birthed from earth's hidden crevices with features defying categorization, a reminder that some secrets are closely guarded by nature's impassive facade, and sometimes they reach out and touch those who dare tread too close. This all happened a few years back, not long after I landed my first full-time job and rented a tiny, dingy apartment near the park. A nature nerd myself, I spent most weekends on trails, soaking in the solitude to unwind from the office stress. Maybe not my healthiest coping mechanism, but it sure beats self-medicating like half of my co-workers seem to do. That Saturday morning started out peaceful. I parked my rusty old pickup on the shoulder of the road in the Mount Rainier National Park and headed into the old-growth forest for a day hike. Everything was familiar, moss clinging to the bark of ancient Douglas firs, a symphony of birdsong, the faint, earthy scent of decay and new growth. It was my kind of therapy. A little later, on my way back, that's when things got weird. First, there was this silence. The complete absence of sound that makes your hair stand up on end and your chest tighten. The forest that had been so alive suddenly felt dead. No squirrels rustling, no crows squawking. Just pure, unsettling quiet. Then came the smell, musky and sour, almost overpowering. And it hit me, that feeling of being watched. Now, I don't scare easily. Chalk it up to too many late-night nature documentaries, but a stray predator didn't worry me. This felt different, prickling that primal part of my brain that tells you to get the hell out of somewhere. And then, ahead, just a flash in the fading afternoon light, I saw it, a huge, bulky silhouette hunched among the trees— my first thought was that maybe a hiker in dark clothing had gone off trail. Hello? I called out. Nothing. The figure was completely still. Maybe, with any luck, they hadn't heard me. I took a slow step back, heart thumping. With another quiet step, the woods suddenly erupted in a symphony of crashing and breaking branches. Whatever that was... It was barreling toward me. In a blind panic, I whirled around and ran. Fear twisted my gut. All I could think about were claws, teeth, being torn apart in the dense woods with no one to hear my screams. My breath burned as I sprinted, barely dodging tangled branches. I scrambled onto a fallen log and glanced back. There, towering over the bracken, was a massive shape. It walked on two legs like a man, but that's where the similarity ended. Shaggy brown fur covered its enormous body, and its arms. God, those arms were so muscular, like tree trunks ending in thick, curved claws. The face, half hidden in shadow, was flat, almost ape-like, but not quite. I saw a flash of yellow eyes under a heavy brow ridge before it lurched back into the trees. Fear propelled me. My legs became a blur, and I scrambled, tripped, and kept moving. 
Every snap of a fallen twig made me shriek inwardly, expecting to feel those inhuman claws rip into my back. Eventually, I staggered onto the forest road, completely out of breath, my eyes blurry. Collapsing against my truck, I gulped air. Every inch of me ached, and my palms were scraped raw from my frantic clawing at the forest floor. It took me ages before I could convince myself to drive, before the relentless shaking stopped. On the drive home, my mind raced. Had I lost my sanity? Hallucinations wouldn't make those kinds of noises, right? Back in my cramped apartment, I scrubbed myself raw in a scalding shower, desperate to rid myself of the smell, that animal stink that still clung to me. Hours later, exhausted but unable to sleep, I went online. Search terms like Creature and Tyranneer bipedal threw up dozens of pages. I scrolled through blurry photos, witness accounts eerily similar to my own, grainy videos. Then I hit it, Bigfoot. I laughed, a bitter, hysterical sound that filled the empty room. I wasn't a believer in folklore, not by a long shot. But then I replayed the events in my mind, the smell, the sound, the terrifying power in that massive silhouette. In all my years rambling through the wilderness, I'd never seen anything like it. And as much as the logical part of my brain rejected the idea, my gut whispered fearfully that I'd come face to face with a creature the civilized world prefers to dismiss as myth. Now, I haven't returned to Mount Rainier. I quit my job, found one that doesn't leave me mentally strung out and seeking therapy in the wilderness. Instead, I get my nature fix in the public park close to my apartment, and occasionally, on moonless nights, when the city seems far away, I still feel that creeping dread of eyes in the darkness, and the overwhelming fear settles right back into my bones. This happened to me 15 years ago while working in the dense Sequoia National Forest. My name is Benton Ackerman, and my daily routine involved inspecting and maintaining trails, forest facilities, and ensuring the safety of wildlife and people who ventured within this vast expanse of trees. That day began like any other day. The sun shone brightly overhead, while gentle breeze rustled through the leaves. Resting against a tree was Arlo Fairbanks, my co-worker, who was munching on a sandwich. He made a joke about always remembering to pack something with relish to spice up his lunch break. As we walked through the forest, we encountered a group of hikers who reported that some campers had gone missing from their site during the night. The story unnerved us. It wasn't unusual for people to get lost in the forest— but participants in an organized group vanishing without a trace was suspicious. We took down their information and radioed it to our supervisor, who asked us to search for any traces of the missing campers around their last known location. With each step, worry grew as we picked up eerie clues, scattered personal belongings, hastily abandoned campfires, and dragged marks all leading deep into areas of the forest rarely traversed by humans. Arlo frowned and said it reminded him of an old folklore tale his grandmother used to tell him at bedtime about an unnatural creature that haunted vast woodlands. I chuckled nervously at his remark as we ventured deeper towards the unknown. Hours passed when we stumbled upon makeshift barriers composed of branches and stones which bore scratch marks resembling massive claws. Following an unwieldy path, we discovered unmistakable signs of struggle in a secluded clearing splintered trees and blood staining the ground. The area gave off an aura of dread. This wasn't where we wanted to be. Arlo mumbled something about running out of trail mix his voice laden with nervousness. That's when we heard it, faint growls echoing through the forest, 
like the grumblings of a hungry beast lurking in the shadows. The atmospheric pressure seemed to thicken, and our breathing intensified as weariness transformed into gut-wrenching fear. The next moment, everything changed. An unknown creature barreled out of the underbrush and charged at us with astonishing speed. It was murky in appearance, and unlike anything I had ever seen before quadrupedal with a hulking physique, layered with musculature that rippled beneath a rough hide. In the heat of the moment, Arlo reached for his firearm, ready to shoot. He trembled as he aimed and pulled the trigger repeatedly, but to no avail. It only enraged the beast further. Towering above us, it unleashed an earth-shattering roar that sent chills down our spines. Realizing we were ill-prepared for such an encounter, we abandoned our mission to find the campers and fled back towards civilization in blind panic. As we navigated the densely packed forest, we tried contacting other rangers through our radios without success. Our calls went unanswered. With daylight fading, terror took hold. There was little chance of escaping this forest alive unless something miraculous happened. The fear hung thick in my throat as I raced beside Arlo through twisted trails and leaped over treacherous roots and rocks, anything to escape the grotesque monstrosity hunting us down mercilessly. In a blur of adrenaline-fueled haste time vanished, as did any sense of bearings we once possessed within the dense foliage surrounding us unyieldingly. Death seemed imminent when suddenly a clearing appeared in front of us. As Arlo and I stumbled into the clearing, exhausted but still driven by panic, the unknown creature seemed to hesitate. Confused by the sudden expansion of space, it slowed down its pursuit. This sudden pause galvanized us into action. There was no time for questions or doubts only decisive maneuvers if we wanted to stay ahead of this relentless predator. Arlo scooped up a fallen branch and swung at the creature forcefully when it came charging in again. Though he managed to land a strong blow, it did little to deter the monster as it lunged once more towards him with ferocious tenacity. Run! Arlo shouted, his eyes wide with panic. Together, we hurtled through the clearing and plunged into the dark underbrush again. Arlo's hand trembled when he tried reaching for his radio once more. The signal continued to be distorted, and he let go of the communication device in frustration. Our decision not to call for help only intensified our fear, making each step heavy and cumbersome. A sharp pain erupted in my leg as a jetting root caught my foot mid-stride sending me crashing into a nearby bush concealed with thorny branches. Blood oozed from several punctures on my arms and legs while helplessness consumed me. Go! Leave me! I yelled at Arlo through gritted teeth as I struggled to get back on my feet. No way, he replied firmly lifting me without any hesitation and supporting my arm over his shoulder. We're getting out of this together. With every ounce of strength that remained, we limped our way through the trees as fast as we could manage. The monster had found us again and was gaining on us with each passing moment. It roared loudly, foam dripping from its grotesque gums that encased its sharp teeth. By a stroke of luck or divine intervention— we stumbled upon another clearing this one with a ranger station visible on the other side. The sight of our potential escape refuge filled us with renewed determination. We sprinted towards it and managed to reach its doors just as the creature caught up to us. Arlo slammed the door shut before it could enter, his eyes scanning the dusty room for anything that could be used as a barricade. Spotting an old wooden cabinet, we shoved it in front of the door, knowing full well that it would not hold for long. From inside the station, we regained control over our radio and radioed for help. While we waited for their arrival, outside the tortured howls of that monstrous creature pierced through the night air like knives. It was only when our fellow rangers arrived, drawn by our frantic messages, 
that we finally felt safe for the first time since this nightmare began. Under their escort, we walked out of that cursed forest as sunlight started filtering through the trees. Though no trace of it was found afterward not even after extensive search missions were conducted by teams of rangers, I can still remember every detail of the creature's appearance, its hideous visage like something sculpted from my darkest nightmares and its immense power barely contained within layers of rippling flesh. To this day, I know not what it was exactly or where it came from. I can only assume it must have been some species not yet discovered by science or perhaps mercifully forgotten. The forest looms large as a potent reminder of what still remains undiscovered in our world. Arlo and I moved on from our brush with death. However, not a day goes by when we don't remember how things could have ended differently. Though never truly gone, our fear had transformed into a steely respect for nature's untamed power. The loss haunts us but impels us to continue performing our duties as rangers, with caution and humility, in tribute to those who had been devoured by the darkness we once shared. The image of that predatory creature still lingers and remains as a constant reminder that not all of nature's mysteries reveal themselves willingly, nor are all of them benign. I had just started my shift, feeling the lingering taste of yesterday's lasagna in my thoughts. My job as a small-town cop here in Forks, Washington had its ups and downs. I'm Tomasz Petrowski, by the way, but most folks around here just call me Tom. Life as a small-town cop had its perks, stable job, strong community ties, and a chance to make a positive impact. It was around 10 p.m. when I received a call from dispatch. Officer Petrowski, we've got reports of a missing person, Shirley Pichowix. She was last seen at the duck pond near the outskirts of town. Over the years, people occasionally went missing in our quiet town, but it was mostly limited to hikers getting lost or teens sneaking out for an adventure. As I drove down the road toward the duck pond, my cruiser's headlights cut through the darkness that enveloped the dense forest surrounding me. The pond was isolated and attracted many wildlife species I wasn't expecting any clues there. Upon arrival, I exited my vehicle and carefully surveyed the area using my flashlight. The once tranquil pond now exuded an eerie atmosphere that unsettled me in ways unknown to me before. Officer Petrowski came a voice over my walkie-talkie. We found her car parked behind the old Thompson house. That got my attention. Thompson house was abandoned for years now and wasn't anywhere near the pond. I headed to the abandoned house and found Shirley's car just as they said. As I approached the decaying building, I noticed deep scratches in the wooden siding. They weren't like anything I had seen before. Halfway across the yard, I stumbled onto something, falling hard on my knees. Looking down with my flashlight's beam assisting me, I saw bloodied clothing strewn everywhere. It was Shirley's. My heart rate quickened. This is Officer Petrowski at the Thompson house. We have a possible crime scene. Need backup over. Dispatch acknowledged, and I continued my search for Shirley. Suddenly, I heard distant cries for help coming from inside the old house. As a cop, I swallowed my fears and entered the dark building. Shirley! I shouted. Shirley P. Chowix. Can you hear me? As I ventured through the cold, dilapidated home, I discovered the source of the cries that was coming from the basement. Though skeptical about what would happen next, Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw down those rickety stairs. Strange symbols painted on walls with blood set the stage for a gruesome sight. Mangled bodies among pools of blood, entrails hanging like twisted holiday decorations. 
Amidst them was Shirley, beaten but alive, her eyes wide with terror as she pleaded for help. Before I could reach her, something enormous overpowered me. It had scaled, slimy skin and eerie pale green eyes that bore into mine. The creature hissed menacingly through its elongated snout brimming with needle-sharp teeth before disappearing into the darkness just as quickly as it had appeared. Backup finally arrived, yet there was no trace of the horrifying creature that had just attacked me. We were struggling to comprehend what just happened in this sleepy little town. All we could do was collect evidence and try our best to unravel the mystery that enveloped us ever tighter, a monstrous conflict that only seemed to thicken and darken with every passing moment. As one suspect turned to two and then three, we found ourselves following leads left by shattered lives and pained expressions all victims in their own right to this otherworldly terror that lurked in our once tranquil town. But it whispered indifference towards our efforts and continued to maul, kill, and terrorize without thought or feeling. Everything we knew was beginning to crumble around us, victims clamoring every way we could imagine. Still, as the missing persons list piled high, we refused to step down, Determined to see the end to this havoc being wrought by a creature unknown in origin, thought, or deed. It didn't take long for the townsfolk to panic. Neighbors I'd known my whole life barred their doors and windows, afraid that they would be the creature's next target. Conversations on the street were tense and terse, as we all wondered who might be next, or worse, who could be taken right in front of us. Shirley and I, both recovering from our injuries, found ourselves at the center of the town hall meeting. People demanded answers and protection, but we had little to offer. Please, cried Mrs. Roberts, her voice choked with fear. What do we do? What kind of monster is this? I swallowed hard before answering. We don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it moves faster than anything I've ever seen before. It's strong and agile. I don't know how we can possibly stop it. A murmur of despair swept across the room. It only took a moment for talk to turn to action. We need to organize search parties, suggested Jim Hopkins. We can comb the town and flush this thing out. Pete Douglas chimed in. No, we need to protect ourselves and those still alive. Fortify our homes and wait for it to make a move. Arguments erupted all around me as people debated the best course of action. Feeling helpless and drained from my own ordeal with the creature, I leaned against Shirley for support. What are we going to do? She asked softly. I don't know, I admitted bitterly. I didn't sign up for this when I became a police officer. Days turned into an exhausting haze of sleepless nights on patrol and horrified screams announcing another gruesome discovery in the morning. Then one evening when on patrol with Officer Daniels, barely able to stay awake after another nightmarish day, a lead finally came our way, an anonymous tip directing us to a remote cabin deep in the woods just outside of town. Officer Daniels radioed back to the station, requesting backup immediately as we cautiously approached the eerie location. The sun was setting, casting long shadows through the dense trees surrounding the cabin. As we stepped closer, I noticed a rancid smell emanating from the wood shack. Officer Daniels gestured for me to take one side of the entrance while he took the other. He positioned himself and then nodded at me. Taking a deep breath, I prepared myself for what I might find inside. With great force, we kicked open the door and stepped inside. The smell was even worse within the cramped space of the cabin, making me gag reflexively. The floor was slick and sticky in some places, and after taking another glance around, I quickly realized why blood. There were no signs of life, human or creature, 
but there were numerous carcasses hanging from hooks along the wall, animals with gashes and slashes torn through their flesh. What is this place? Officer Daniels asked with a horrified expression on his face. Some kind of sick hunting den? I whispered to my partner as we frantically searched for clues that could lead us back to our monster. It seemed like too much of a leap to believe that such an ancient beast would prefer cans of baked beans. The research facility had clear records about what had been done over time during experiments, changing once normal wild animals into grotesque monstrosities filled with murderous rage towards humanity as well as each other. I found myself hiking through the dense forest of the Klamath Mountains in Northern California, enjoying the solitude and beauty it offered. The sun was setting, casting a golden glow through the trees. I remember chuckling to myself at how glad I was that today was just a regular day. My name is Alden Burkhart, a 35-year-old outdoor enthusiast who often seeks solace in nature. As I continued through the woods, Contemplating life and appreciating the wonders around me, I suddenly stumbled upon an unusual, yet oddly captivating, sight. There, in a small clearing, was a scene straight out of a horror movie several mutilated animal carcasses laid before me. The air held an uneasy stillness that lingered on my skin like an icy breath. Instead of feeling fear or disgust, though, Curiosity got the best of me as I thought about what could do such a thing. As I surveyed the grotesque display before me, I accidentally stepped on a dry twig which snapped beneath my boot. All hope that remained for quiet exploration vanished instantly. In response, there came an unsettling clatter from deep within the forest. That's when it emerged, its deceptively lanky frame shrouded by darkness as it moved towards me with ominous intent. Its head resembled that of a deer skull adorned with razor-sharp antlers. Elongated limbs supporting its hulking torso suggested something unnatural from the depths of nightmares. So, this is how I meet my end. I murmured under my breath. I guess there's no help for cardiophobes. Instead of fleeing in panic, though, Something within compelled me to stand my ground after all. There wasn't really anyone else who could help out in these remote woods. Hey, buddy! Is Halloween early this year? I taunted nervously, hoping some humor would ease my terrified heart. But as we know, villains don't often find humor amusing. Seemingly unfazed by the retort, it continued to move in my direction with deliberate steps. What was I going to run anyway? I decided it was time to take some action. I grabbed the hunting knife from my belt and eyed the creature with as much confidence as I could muster. The way it swayed toward me felt like a surreal dance in slow motion as it came ever closer, like an eerie puppet master controlling the strings of fate. Or was I witnessing evolution's attempt at mimicking the human form? Whatever this thing was... Its movements were far from natural, and every fundamental instinct screamed for me to stay away. But maybe that was how it hunted by stalking and intimidating until prey had no choice but to capitulate. Growing tired of the predator-prey dance, I decided to take charge with a well-practiced swipe of my blade, aimed at one of its thick limbs. A burst of red punctuated the air accompanied by a guttural growl that told me I'd angered it further. Feeling both exhilarated and frightened from this unlikely feat in face of danger, I borrowed a joke from a classic horror film to lighten my nerves. How do you make a werewolf stew? I paused for dramatic effect, yet fully aware it wasn't about to laugh. Keep him waiting! As I stared at the creature before me, I realized that calling for help would not hold much advantage. It wouldn't arrive in time and my phone had no signal in this remote part of the woods. It was now or never. Ignoring the pain in my leg from the previous swipe, I aimed my next attack at its other limbs, 
hoping to weaken it even further. It again growled with discomfort, but it didn't back down. It lunged towards me with surprising agility. Instinctively, I tried to dodge, but its sharp antlers caught on the fabric of my shirt, pinning me against the tree. The creature's skull-like face neared mine uncomfortably close, and its foul breath invaded my nostrils. With my free hand holding the knife, I slashed at its limb that held me captive against the tree. The creature hissed as its grip loosened and I dropped down to the ground. Not wanting to give it another chance, I hobbled away as quickly as my injured leg allowed. The distance between us grew wider with each step I took. My desperation for survival pushed me to run harder and faster than ever before. Somehow, I spotted a hunter's cabin up ahead and realized that there may be a potential weapon inside or at least a place to hide from this nightmare. The intensity of its growls alarmed me from behind. There was no doubt that it still pursued relentlessly. But something else caught my attention as well several gunshots echoed in the air. Staggering into the cabin's yard, I saw a pair of hunters armed with rifles. They appeared just as terrified yet resolved to bring down the creature that pursued me. The creature hesitated for a moment upon seeing them but ultimately continued its assault, clearly undeterred by their firearms. With fear etched onto their faces, they fired round after round at their attacker. Despite sustaining multiple gunshots, the creature still fought back wildly with its remaining limbs. Eventually, the hunters managed to land a final shot directly at its skull, and it collapsed to the ground. Panting heavily, they looked at each other in disbelief as their unusual prey lay motionless among the leaves. Are you okay? One hunter asked me, taking notice of my wounded leg. Yeah, I'll manage, I replied, trying to steady myself. They helped me inside the cabin and treated my leg. We left the creature's corpse in the woods. None of us wanted any part of it. As days went by and life started returning to normalcy, my injuries began to heal. The hunters decided not to speak about this event, fearing that people might consider them delusional. I agreed not to describe our ordeal as well because there was no rational explanation for what had happened but the memory of that chilling encounter would be forever engraved in our minds. It served as a gruesome reminder that sometimes nature presented us with horrors beyond our wildest imagination, a lesson we unwillingly learned during our face-off with an unfathomable predator in its habitat. I remember that fateful trip like it was yesterday. I had decided to visit Peterson's Bluff in the U.S., the spot of my childhood memories. The sun was setting after a long day of hiking, and I grew more nostalgic with each step. I'd been cracking jokes all day to ease my nerves, saying things like, Who put this river here? As a kid, I could have sworn it was five minutes away. My laughter echoed through the forest. Having brought a shotgun for protection, I walked confidently towards my destination, a small abandoned mining town hidden amongst the forest. My name is Harlan Brooks, and I'm not someone who gets scared easily, but there was something unsettling about the journey that lie ahead. As dusk arrived, night descended quickly upon me and the forest's ethereal stillness sent shivers down my spine. The darkness encroached upon me like an otherworldly menace, forcing me to question every shadow along the path. I soon stumbled upon an old friend from our childhood days spent exploring this eerie woodland. Bexley Thorne and his sister Leora were huddling together nervously near an abandoned cabin. They were affable as always, but their happy reunion turned somber as they described violent activity in the area stories of mutilated animals and unexplained deaths sent my heart racing. The shadows grew darker when we heard faint whispers echoing among the trees. Against our better judgment, 
We continued along the path grasping our weapons tightly as an unnerving sense of dread consumed us. It was Bexley who spotted it first he queried aloud if that shadow had been there just moments ago. I could barely make out its silhouette, tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs branching out in twisted angles. It was difficult to be specific on details because its head looked like a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers arrayed horrifically. It exuded menace, its body contorted and unnatural. Panic overran us, and we dashed back to the cabin, boarded the doors, and called for help. Our phones refused to cooperate as the signal was weak in this remote area. The feeling that something sinister was watching intensified as whispers turned into blood-curdling growls. With guns reloaded and knives sharpened, we looked out through gaps in the boarded windows. Leora spotted at first the creature was circling the cabin, studying us like prey. It was then she asked the question hanging in all our minds. Harlan, do you think it's smart enough to unlock doors? They should really consider upgrading to digital security around here. I joked nervously trying to lighten the dreadful mood. As night progressed, so did our desperation. Our calls for help were still met with resounding silence. Leora's gentle teardrops imprinted themselves in our minds, her fear accentuating names of missing neighbors that resonated deeply within us. As stories turned into evidence before our eyes, I revealed my own gruesome discovery from earlier in the day a mutilated deer bearing a macabre signature, carved runes that chilled us to the bone. We took turns maintaining watch through gaps in our barricade. The creature appeared more horrific as night extended its reign. Shadows danced over its deer-like skull that seemed almost sentient as sunlight smudged against its antlered silhouette. Bexley gasped when he saw what I assumed was the beast again after some time had passed, but this time, it was not alone. Hunched creatures copped along in grotesque unison behind it lured by some dark abyssal purpose. Leora sobbed pitifully as they swarmed locked doors and whispered unintelligible horrors outside windows we dared not open. We knew they were waiting for just one opportunity to attack and that it was only a matter of time before they found it. Bexley asked, What do we do? I took a deep breath and tried to think logically. We can't stay here forever, I said. We have to make a plan and get help. Leora continued sobbing, her face buried in her hands. Bexley frantically looked around the room as if searching for an idea. Okay, okay, I'll try to make a run for it, he said with determination. There's a police station not far from here. If I can get there, we'll have help soon. Leora's face emerged from her hands. No, Bexley, you can't. They'll catch you. He placed his hands on her shoulders, giving her a steady look. It's our only chance. Turning to me, he asked, Can you watch over Liara while I'm gone? Mustering courage, I nodded. Just be careful out there. With one last determined glance at both of us, Bexley slipped out the door and began his desperate sprint towards the police station. Silence hung around us as Leora and I kept our vigil at the barricade. We heard faint noises outside, unintelligible whispers and sickening laughter, but the creatures didn't try to force their way in. Two agonizing hours later, we heard a knock on the door and voices shouting, Police! Open up! Relief washed over me as we opened the door to find two officers accompanied by Bexley. Thank God you made it, Leora whispered as she embraced Bexley. The officers wasted no time in taking control of the situation. They listened as we recounted what had happened, their faces growing graver with each word. As they began preparations for facing these unknown assailants, they focused on strategy. We'll help you all board up your windows and doors to keep them out, an officer explained. We have called for reinforcements, but it could take some time for them to arrive. We'll do our best to protect you all in the meantime. 
Over the next few hours, our once quiet neighborhood transformed into a makeshift fortress. Armed officers patrolled the streets as terrified residents peered through makeshift barricades, waiting for any gruesome attack from these bizarre creatures. Despite our precautions, we weren't entirely safe. One early morning, an officer spotted a group of creatures attempting to enter a nearby home but was unable to save its occupants. Tension and fear only grew as news of the gruesome scene spread. The horrifying siege continued until backup finally arrived, bringing with them expertise and equipment more suited for these relentless, monstrous attackers. Sleep-deprived and shaken, we were ushered out of our homes and loaded into waiting vehicles that would take us to a secure location. As we drove away from our neighborhood-turned-battlefield, I couldn't stop thinking about the mutilated deer and those chilling carved runes. Somewhere deep down, I knew this was just the beginning of something far more sinister. But for now, all I wanted was shelter from those nightmarish visions. Our small community never truly felt safe again. Over time, people moved away, while others struggled to come to terms with those horrific days when those grotesque creatures terrorized us. For many years following the incident, I refused to venture out beyond the safety of my home after dark. I would helplessly remember Bexley's bravery and Leora's immense fear and grief when she lost her beloved neighbors. The scars left by these gruesome events still remain. It's an eerie trace of something no one could ever fully comprehend or forget. I had always been a skeptic, never truly believing in anything out of the ordinary. But my skepticism was put to the test that one unforgettable night in Yosemite National Park. Let's get going, said my colleague, Harlan Banks, as he tightened up his hiking boots a man who shared my skepticism when it came to supernatural entities. I mumbled an agreement as I fixed my backpack straps on my shoulders, trying to find some humor in our situation. You know, they say people go missing here without a trace. I jested. Harlan, rolling his eyes, took the lead and marched down the trail. The sun started to set, casting long shadows through the dense forest around us. We continued our trek, discussing recent events crimes reported and unsolved in this vast national park. The conversation soon turned thrilling. Nothing too disturbing but enough to make our surroundings feel a bit more alive. At one point we stopped walking so Harlan could take a sip from his water bottle. The gentle rustling of leaves caught my attention, and I noticed something strange moving ahead of us. My pulse quickened as I squinted at what appeared to be a massive creature lumbering through the trees. It paid no attention to us focused on something else entirely. What is that? Harlan asked nervously as he followed my gaze. I decided then was not the time for a joke and said with all honesty, I have no idea. The creature was unlike anything we had ever seen or heard before huge like a bear but slimmer and faster than any wild animal should be. Its menacing eyes scanned the surroundings as it continued its prowl deep into the national park. We began to wonder if it was responsible for the recent rash of disappearances and could only hope that we wouldn't be added to its list of victims. Our journey continued throughout dusk and into nightfall as we tried to remain as quiet as possible. The distant howls and roars of the elusive creature had us on edge as we couldn't quite determine its whereabouts. Joking had helped us cope with our fears, lighten the atmosphere, and pass the time but now was not a good time for humor. Harlan and I shared a silent understanding. We were in over our heads having come face to face with the source of these mysterious events. At one point I caught a glimpse of something horrifying, a torn and bloody shirt hanging from the branches at eye level. Holding back bile, I decided not to mention it to Harlan. Instead, we continued down the path in tense silence. 
We must have walked for hours when it felt like the weight of dread was finally easing up. That momentary reprieve, however, was shattered by the sound of rustling leaves and cracking branches closing in on us. My heart hammered in my chest as we both realized what was bearing down on us. The monster was moving quickly now possibly provoked by the fear rolling off both Harlan and me. Run! Harlan yelled at me as he broke into a full sprint. I hesitated for just a millisecond before launching after him. As we bolted through the forest desperately clutching our gear, we realized with chilling certainty that this creature's skills exceeded human imagination its attacks described by witnesses were no exaggeration or fabricated story. The pursuit seemed endless. Running through unfamiliar terrain made every step more precarious than the last, but we had no choice slowing down could mean certain death. Suddenly harrowing screams pierced through the air sounds that would haunt our nightmares for years to come. My heart raced even faster when I realized they originated from someone who had been nearby. Another unfortunate soul lured into this hellish domain only to befall an unspeakable fate. The wind began teasing my hair around my face, obscuring my vision just barely as we continued to flee from the nightmarish predator. Sweat stung our eyes, the sharp inhalations of cold air burned our throats, but we forced ourselves to keep going. Harlan put on a final desperate burst of speed when calamity struck. The ground beneath us gave way. We hurtled through the air and swallowed panic screams before slamming into the hard ground below. The fall knocked the wind out of me, while Harlan cried out in pain. In a split second, my instincts kicked in, and I scrambled to my feet. Harlan was struggling with something lodged in his leg his scream now made sense. I hesitated for a moment, unsure whether to help or continue running. Harlan screamed at me to leave him and go. I turned and sprinted as fast as my legs could carry me the sounds of Harlan's distress and the creature's sinister pursuit echoing through the trees. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I tried to find safety. Ahead, I spotted a dilapidated cabin barely visible through the trees. My only hope was to barricade myself inside and hope the creature wouldn't be able to break through. Reaching the cabin, I practically threw myself through the door and slammed it shut, locking it and piling anything I could find against it cabinets, chairs, anything. In an instant of silence, I pressed my ear against the door, listening intently for any indication of the creature's presence outside. The air was heavy with tension, each sound originating from within the cabin amplifying my terror. A distant wail shattered the silence. It wasn't Harlan this time, but another victim that had fallen prey to this nightmarish beast. Its gruesome handiwork seemed scattered throughout these woods. How could something so monstrous exist? And why hadn't anyone been able to stop it? My thoughts were disrupted by scratching on the door slow, methodical, teasing. Bow rose in my throat as I fought the urge to scream. Every scratch felt like a countdown to an excruciating end, one that would inevitably befall me as well. With shaking hands... I pulled out my phone intent on calling for help but realized there was no signal in this godforsaken place. A deep growl resonated outside then silence settled once again. Trapped in this decrepit cabin with no means to escape, I racked my brain for any knowledge of what I was facing or who could help, only to come up empty. Hopelessness consumed me. This creature seemed an unstoppable force of destruction and gore. It would continue its rampage unchallenged unless someone could identify and end its reign of terror. I'd be lying if I said Harlan didn't cross my mind as I stood, isolated, unsure of his fate or that of any other victims we heard along the way. How many had suffered before us? A vivid image of the creature killing Harlan filled my thoughts, prompting a quiet sob that escaped my lips. The scratching ceased and I felt a glimmer hope. Perhaps it had given up, moved on to terrorize someone else. It was in that moment that the door began shaking the creature through itself against the barricade in relentless fury, seeming more determined than ever to get to me. 
in those final moments, as the door splintered inward under the force of the creature's assault, I caught a fleeting glimpse of it just before I blacked out from fear. It wasn't merely a beast but a twisted combination of man and predator something out of dark folklore materialized in front of my very eyes. Incontrovertibly beyond human understanding, its existence was left unchecked and unspoken. No one knew how to fight it or call it by its name. And then everything went black. I woke up in agony hours later still alive but gravely injured from my encounter with the creature, abandoned on the doorstep of destruction. With no means to call for help and miles away from anyone who could provide even an ounce of relief to such suffering, despair engulfed me. As days turned into weeks and locals found me wandering aimlessly out of the woods half-dead from blood loss and shock, questions about what happened lay thick in the air. But who could believe my account of that horrific creature, a twisted figment from folklore, made flesh? At every detail I revealed, I saw disbelief and skepticism clouding their eyes. And so, Harlan's fate remained a mystery forever enshrouded in uncertainty while the beast that caused such indiscriminate devastation continued to lurk within the shadows. The overwhelming knowledge of its existence weighed on me like an anchor, pulling me into the depths and drowning me in fear for the rest of my days. I remember the moment as if it just happened. I was taking a break from my mundane office job, traveling alone to Yosemite National Park to reconnect with nature. My name is Alaric Greystone, a simple tax consultant from Minnesota. I needed an escape from the everyday grind, so a week-long hiking trip through Yosemite seemed perfect. The park was breathtaking, filled with lush green forests, towering waterfalls, and majestic sights. During that trip, I formed a bond with others in my hiking group, including Lenora Hackinson and Dash Unsworth. We shared more than just camp meals. We shared memories and stories about our personal lives. One particular day, we stumbled upon a cluster of old log cabins left abandoned inside the park. The place was decrepit, and unkempt but evoked an eerie charm that intrigued us. As we ventured closer, Lenora mentioned how strange it was that none of us had seen any park rangers since our arrival. Laughing it off as mere coincidence, we continued exploring the cabins until we began to find strange signs, reddish-brown stains on the walls, shredded sleeping bags filled with bones, and discarded camping gear in disarray. Something sinister had happened here. We decided to share our concern with other hikers and their guides when we noticed them speed walking away from us with wide eyes. They refused to involve themselves further after realizing the danger they were in but hesitated to explicitly say why. As we camped near El Capitan that evening, Dash silently stirred the campfire while staring at his hands instead of partaking in conversation. He shared how he once held his twin brother's lifeless body after he'd wandered away while camping, a somber story of vulnerability in nature. Elsewhere nearby, hushed whispers impeded our relaxation, their origins unknown but drawing near. Our curiosity peaked once again. We attempted to blend our voices with the quiet murmurs only to be greeted with sudden, unnatural silence. The atmosphere grew heavy as our instincts warned us of impending danger. From a distance, we spotted an indistinguishable creature lurking among the shadows, its snarling growl echoing through the quiet forest. Unnerved by its presence, we opted to maintain a safe distance while observing. It wasn't human, approximately nine feet tall with elongated limbs and claw-like fingers, shrouded in tattered fur or skin. Its eyes ominously emitted a faint glow like fireflies in the night. Realizing it was no ordinary inhabitant of the park, fear compelled Dash and Lenora to leave no trace behind as we moved away from the creature's chilling gaze. We began to panic, 
shouting at each other about whether we should report this creature to someone or simply accept our horrifying discovery as an unspeakable secret. Sharing feelings of apprehension and dread, Lenora suggested that locals might know more about the enigmatic beast, something she recalled from regional folklore and urban legends. We agreed and sought help from nearby campers who refused assistance out of sheer terror. Dash's frustration reached a breaking point as he kicked rocks toward the water's edge while murmuring several obscenities under his breath. Unsure about our next steps but desperate for answers, we decided there was strength in numbers, seeking refuge in a cave close to where other hikers rested for the night. Despite our attempts at slumber within the stony enclosure, anxiety crept into each one of us as we struggled to comprehend recent events. I wondered how many times this obscure monstrosity had terrorized unsuspecting parkgoers who had no choice but to live with their unfortunate shared secret for fear of ridicule or disbelief. Outside, screams echoed throughout Yosemite Valley that made our blood run cold. We dashed out into the darkness in search of their origin. The gruesome sight that greeted us indicated the nameless beast had attacked again. Horrified, we found hikers' remains scattered among defiled tents, their faces etched with expressions of mortal terror as they encountered their merciless end. The questions now running through my mind overwhelmed me. Could we have done more to prevent these deaths? Did anyone listen to the premonitions and leave before it was too late? Lenora Dash and I decided to inform the park rangers about our experiences and observations. We knew that they might not believe us because the creature couldn't be described with any known animal species. But we had to try, as we couldn't ignore the lives lost and the threat that loomed over us. As the sun began to rise, we walked towards the ranger station together. Upon our arrival, we were greeted by an older gentleman named Jim who appeared to be an experienced ranger. We went on to tell him everything, the inhuman attacks, hikers' remains, and our encounter with the mysterious creature. Jim listened intently, surprisingly not scoffing at our story despite its strangeness. Instead, he hesitated and then shared a similar tale passed down through generations among the rangers. A fearsome creature they called Tahapka, meaning wild beast, in their native tongue, which attacked parkgoers and vanished without a trace. During our conversation with Jim, we noticed a group of other rangers gathering outside the station. They carried rifles and backpacks filled with supplies for an extended patrol. One look at Jim told us that he believed our story but didn't want the panic to spread among others. He informed us that they would send these armed rangers out in search of Tahapka or anything related to it so that no one else would fall victim to this ruthless creature. For some time after that incident, Yosemite Valley remained under constant surveillance of heavily armed guards patrolling its boundaries. Fewer incidents of death and mutilations were reported in this period as it seemed like Tahapka had retreated away from human settlements. However, hikers continued to whisper about their encounters while sitting around campfires or in dimly lit shelters during stormy nights. Rumors circulated that Tahapka had migrated deeper into Yosemite's vast wilderness. Others insisted that it remained within arm's reach, but was more cunning in its pursuit of victims. One day, I received news about a group of researchers that ventured into Tahapka's supposed lair and returned with evidence. A tuft of coarse hair, large unidentifiable droppings, and a few blurred photographs suggesting that the creature had adapted to its environment over time. Despite all these efforts to stop or at least get more insights about Tahapka, no concrete measures could be taken as it remained elusive and distant. As years went by, the scars left behind by the gruesome attacks gradually healed. Life in Yosemite Valley returned to normal, albeit with cautionary tales about Tahapka. 
The guards still patrolled and kept watchful eyes over the valley as we remained hopeful that one day, we might have answers to our questions concerning this stealthy killer lurking in the shadows. Every so often, I find myself reminiscing about those horrifying events we experienced. Although time had helped us learn to carry on with our daily lives, we never forgot those who lost their lives to Tahapka. The thought that such an unknown creature continued to exist within our world served as both a sobering reminder and a catalyst to remain vigilant in our surroundings. No longer could we enjoy the tranquility of Yosemite's captivating landscape without acknowledging the blood that had been shed beneath its towering trees and serene streams. And as for me, whenever I venture out into the wilderness again, be it Yosemite or any other corner of the world shrouded in mystery, I'll always remember those fateful nights when dread loomed overhead and wonder how much more remains undiscovered or lurking in the dark corners of our planet waiting for us to stumble upon them. I, Emmett Greystone, found myself in the dense and seemingly never-ending forest of Epping outside London. The damp ground and chilly air clung to my skin, but I focused on the mission at hand. I belonged to a covert task force dedicated to hunting down the monsters that consumed our worst nightmares. We were exceptional at what we did, but it was rarely advertised or celebrated. Our squad consisted of three members, myself, Delilah Nash, and Felix Arts. Even our names were designed to fly under the radar. We were bound by a common belief that humanity needed protection from the unknown creatures lurking in the darkest corners of our world. Tonight's mission led us deep into this seemingly quiet forest where people had gone missing in mysterious and horrifying circumstances. I took a moment to share a memory about my childhood, recounting days when my father would take me hunting in a forest much like this one not realizing that this would become my life's work, hunting far more dangerous prey. As we moved further into the forest, things became eerily silent. The only sound we heard was our own footsteps crunching through leaves and snapping twigs. We didn't dare speak as if breaking the silence would somehow attract danger instead, opting for hand signals to communicate. After hours of searching, we stumbled upon what appeared to be the remnants of what once was a campsite. Torn tents and scattered belongings littered the area, but what truly caught our attention were trails of blood leading off into the trees. Felix looked down at his tracking device, his eyes widening as realization kicked in. Whatever had created this carnage was still nearby. Our senses heightened. We began following the blood trail with weapons ready. While huddled behind a tree, I noticed something odd, large footprints accompanied by an acrid smell that seemed both animalistic and foreign. It wasn't an odor that could be easily identified. We followed the strange tracks, and as we neared a murky pond, we spotted something lurking in the water. The creature was unlike anything I could have imagined resembling an alligator but with an elongated snout full of razor-sharp teeth and grotesque bumps on its back that looked like cysts. Its eyes seemed to gleam with otherworldly intelligence. What made it even more unsettling was how it effortlessly moved on land. It slithered out of the water and began dragging itself in our direction. We ducked down, ensuring we were hidden by trees watching as it devoured the remains of a deer with sickening efficiency. Suddenly, our radios crackled to life. Delilah's voice cut through the tension a grim warning about approaching the creature. Her voice sounded shaky as she described seeing another hunter on the forest floor, his body barely recognizable. It hit me hard, realizing that despite all our skills and preparation, we might not be safe. As we contemplated our next move, the creature jerked its head in our direction. Its senses were acute. 
There was no time to call for help or escape if we didn't act quickly. More people would lose their lives at this beast's hands or worse, jaws. Both Delilah and I readied our rifles while Felix unpacked his own secret weapon, a specialized fragmentation grenade designed to strategically disorient the monster without harming us. I glanced at my teammates. Their solemn faces mirrored my own determination. The breakneck pace of advancing events coupled with the fear of imminent danger had our adrenaline-pumping sweats started forming on their foreheads. We shared one last nod before moving forward into a battle that could change everything. The creature was swift and vicious. It lunged at us from nearly every angle but we managed to sidestep its relentless attacks to avoid being eviscerated. In a breathtaking moment, Felix hurled the grenade into the beast's open mouth as it charged toward us. The explosion stunned it, causing massive damage but not killing it outright. We knew we had to act fast, so we scrambled to our feet, each of us acting with silent precision, trying to coordinate our attacks. Felix motioned for me to take aim from the left while Delilah covered the right. He would go for the front again. I glanced at Delilah's phone, which showed both our locations and the monster's approximation on GPS. We needed backup in case things went south but calling for help meant attracting unwarranted attention and revealing our current predicament. That was not an option. Delilah whispered into her radio, asking headquarters for a cover story, some kind of accident or natural disaster that could be reported later to buy us time. Her urgent request met with affirmation from those listening in. The creature thrashed about in pain from the grenade explosion. It looked disoriented, its scales smoking from the blast. Its once sharp claws appeared ragged and dulled from repeated contact with the ground as it dragged itself one last time before stopping forcibly. We knew this was our moment. We closed in on it from all sides while taking measured shots to finish it off. The creature roared angrily, clearly aware of our presence but unable to pinpoint which danger was closest. With expert timing, Felix threw another grenade at the beast's face, hoping to incapacitate it long enough for us to put it down permanently. The explosion rocked us back as we braced ourselves against nearby trees and debris. As the smoke cleared, we saw that the creature was still not dead. It lay there panting heavily, black blood dripping from its many wounds. Suddenly something changed within it. Its eyes widened with fear as if realizing what was happening for the first time like a terrible epiphany or perhaps desperation had finally taken hold after continuous attacks on its own life. The creature began to tremble violently like a wounded animal backed into a corner. Then suddenly it let out a guttural cry and started to convulse its body contorting unnaturally as though something was trying to crawl out from within. In horror, we watched the creature's skin tear and rupture, splitting open in places as bizarre structures almost like limbs or tentacles burst forth. There was a nauseating stench of rot and blood that accompanied this gruesome transformation. Backup finally arrived in the form of our teammates and a containment unit. They managed to capture the severely weakened creature, trapping it within a specially designed cage meant for cases like this. Nobody had expected that we would encounter such a foe with such grotesque abilities that defied explanation. After the traumatic encounter, we made our way back to headquarters in silence. The death of one of our hunters weighed heavily on our minds. We knew that we had managed to emerge victorious against the creature only by great luck and immense efforts. It reminded me that despite our advantages, we were always mere humans facing foes far beyond our understanding. Felix reported to our superiors about the incident and submitted everything we had captured on film, from the gruesomeness itself to the fear-inspiring changes the creature went through under duress. 
It was evident that it was entirely different from anything any of us had ever seen before. The creature's origin remains unclear even after numerous inquiries and examinations by experts from various fields. Anomalies were discovered in its DNA structure, suggesting potential manipulation or cross-breeding, yet nothing could conclusively explain its nature or powers. A part of me feels as though this case will never yield the answers we seek and whether or not more creatures like it may exist elsewhere is a constant fear at the back of my mind. But as long as there are threats out there in these vast woods, I know I must stand against them no matter how little I understand them. For now, though, I can only hope that the memory of our fallen teammate acts as a reminder that we must always be vigilant, prepared, and most of all, united when facing adversaries that lurk in the dark shadows beyond our world. This happened to me a long time ago. I was visiting my friend Stevie in the isolated area of Dingman's Ferry, Pennsylvania, near the beautiful Delaware River. Stevie lived in a wooden cabin surrounded by dense woods. We enjoyed our evening of chatting, sharing old memories from college, and how our lives unfolded. I can't believe how far we've come, Stevie stated as his eyes filled with nostalgia. Our conversation was cut short by a blood-curdling scream piercing through the tranquil night. Startled, we rushed towards the source, armed with flashlights and a pistol Stevie kept in his cabin. As we navigated through the woods, we found ourselves at an abandoned shack where the scream emanated. The door creaked open as we hesitated to enter, reconsidering our decision to investigate. We wished we hadn't when we noticed bloodstains on the walls and floor. Timidly exploring further, we found a lifeless body, clearly mutilated beyond recognition. Neither of us had seen anything like this before. Did, did an animal do this? I muttered shakily while trying to keep my composure. Whatever it is, whispered Stevie, we should call for help. We tried calling 911 but realized that our mobile signals were non-existent in this remote location. Our only option was to head back to the cabin and use the landline phone. We quickly left the grisly scene behind us, terrified that a predator might be lurking nearby. The trek back felt twice as long as before because each step was filled with panic and paranoia. We finally reached the cabin and frantically called the local ranger station, reporting what we had discovered. Stay put, advised Ranger Joe over the phone. I'm sending back up immediately. As we anxiously waited for responders to arrive, we suddenly noticed an overwhelming stench. The scent belonged to something that reeked of rot and decay. Peering through the window, my heart raced when I saw a hulking silhouette approaching the cabin. What stepped into the moonlight was no ordinary animal. The creature stood bipedal with an elongated snout and piercing red eyes. It resembled an enormous wolf, but its thick, mottled fur and elongated limbs gave an unnatural appearance that sent shudders down my spine. It's right outside. Stevie panicked. With a guttural snarl, the creature lunged at the cabin door, causing us to cower backward. Desperately attempting to secure our escape route, we barricaded the entrance using sofas and chairs. Ranger Joe's voice crackled on the radio, seeking confirmation of our location. I could barely focus on his questions as the creature continued to pound and claw at our makeshift barricade the door barely holding against its onslaught. Ranger Joe. I screamed into the radio. It's attacking us. Hurry. Please hurry. Leaving our ravaged sanctuary to be devoured by a nightmarish entity was unthinkable. All we could do was wait, while staring into each other's panic-stricken eyes as we listened to the growing desperation in our voices. 
the steady pounding echoing ominously in our ears while disarrayed thoughts raced through our minds of what gruesome fate awaited us should that ferocious beast break through. In this heightened state of fear, we devised a plan I hoped would get us out of the cabin before the creature could get through our barricade. Stevie, is there a back door or window, something we can use to make our escape? I asked urgently. Stevie nodded. There's a window in the bedroom. It leads to the forest, but we have to hurry. We scrambled into the bedroom, and Stevie muscled open the heavy window with desperation. As we tumbled into the dark embrace of the forest, I smashed the radio in my hand, all my attempts at calling for help rendered futile. The creature's growls seemed closer now, and our hearts pounded as we stumbled ungracefully through the tangle of underbrush. With every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves, fear consumed us more completely. We knew it was right behind us, stalking us like prey. Time blurred. Minutes seemed like hours as we raced through the woods. Suddenly, a pale figure emerged from behind a tree. It was Ranger Joe. Disoriented and exhausted, I swung wildly at him. He grabbed me by my shoulders and shook me vigorously until my senses returned. What's going on? Are you two all right? He demanded, his voice dripping with concern. Through panting breaths, I tried to explain about the creature, its fur, its claws that tore through wood as if it were paper, but words failed me in my panic. Stevie interjected with details about its red eyes and snarls that sounded like something belonging to either man nor animal. Ranger Joe looked at us skeptically but realized that something had terrified us beyond reason. He decided to lead us back to his truck parked at the boundary of the wooded area. As we reached it, and he handed out flares to each one of us assuring us these would deter the mysterious creature that was in pursuit. Get in the vehicle, and we'll head back to town as quickly as possible. Ranger Joe ordered. We hesitated, clinging to the flares that represented a tiny sliver of safety, but climbed inside his pickup truck as he revved the engine and sped away. The tires kicked up dirt and gravel behind us while darkness enveloped the surrounding forest. As we left, I mustered the courage to glance back. A pair of glowing red eyes stared back at us from the edge of the woods before vanishing into the night. A mix of relief and dread washed over me. We escaped its clutches for now, but it was still out there. Once we reached town, we felt suddenly disoriented by our surroundings. The safety provided by street lights and people's chatter around us felt odd after our terrifying ordeal. It was overwhelming and surreal. After explaining our encounter to local authorities, they seemed skeptical, dismissing our claims as an exaggeration or hallucination fueled by fear. Ranger Joe remained tight-lipped about whether he believed our story or not. Months later, whispers of strange occurrences at the cabin trickled out, leading to speculations about its origins. Some believed it was simply a wild animal passing through dangerous territory. Others whispered about skinwalkers and shapeshifters, creatures ripped from folklore that couldn't possibly be real but couldn't quite be dismissed given what happened to Stevie and me. I don't know what that creature was. All I know is that we were lucky to have survived that dreadful night. The memory of it still haunts me, but I refuse to let my tormentor hold me captive within its grasp any longer. Despite never returning to that cabin or seeking answers on my own accord, the legend of those bloodshot eyes and monstrous growls lives on in my mind as a cautionary tale, one filled with gore, terror, and the unexplainable. My name is Amelia Torres, and this happened to me on June 19, 2016. I've been working for the Park Service on and off since college. 
Love the solitude out here in Big Bend National Park. It's hard to explain. The desert, it feels old wise. There's something about the vastness, the way it puts you in your place. Today was like any other. Patrol the Chizos Basin, check on the campgrounds, the usual. This heat, it drains you, but there's a certain rhythm to it. Had lunch, sat for a bit by the creek down in Oak Canyon, enjoying that little patch of shade. Late afternoon, I got a garbled call on the radio. Something about hikers reported missing up near Emery Peak. Two teenage girls vanished from the trail. Dispatch was scrambling to get a team up there, but I was closest. My gut clenched. Missing persons are rarely good, even with the best outcome. The Emery Peak Trail is rugged. You've got those stunning views, but one misstep can be deadly. I started up the trail, trying to get ahead of the storm I saw brewing in the distance. Radio was patchy up this high, so it was just me, the rocks, and that nagging worry in the back of my mind. Found the girls' abandoned backpacks a ways off the trail, just past the nasty switchback. That's where things took a turn for the strange. Claw marks were raked across the rocks next to the packs. Big ones, no cat I'd ever seen around here. And something was just off about them. Too many claws, angles not quite right. That's when the first scream split the air. High pitch cut off sharp. Cold fear washed over me. I drew my gun, started moving up the slope towards where the sound came from, my boots scraping against the loose shale. The second scream turned my blood to ice. I knew that voice. It was Sarah, one of our summer interns' sweet kid, here on a wildlife studies scholarship. I charged up the last stretch of the incline and burst into a small clearing. And froze. Sarah lay sprawled on the rocks, her shirt soaked in blood. Over her crouched, I still struggle for the words. Tall, impossibly tall, with limbs too long and thin, ending in vicious claws. Its skin had a mottled, leathery look, stretched tight over bone. The head bald, with bulging veins tracing its skull, and its mouth was twisted into a mockery of a grin, full of rows of needle-like teeth. Worst of all were the eyes, bottomless, empty pits that seemed to burn into me. The thing let out a hissing, clicking sound, almost like a laugh, and lunged at Sarah again. I don't even remember deciding, just reacting. I fired once, twice, three times. The echoes of the gunshots were deafening against the canyon walls. The creature staggered back, a spray of inky black blood staining the rocks. It hissed, a terrible, chilling sound, then turned and vanished into the brush with unnatural speed. I scrambled to Sarah's side. She was barely breathing, her leg a mangled mess. I ripped off my belt, used it as a makeshift tourniquet, then fumbled for the radio. But it was dead, probably busted in the scramble up the rocks. The storm broke then, rain lashing down, the sky turning an ominous, bruising purple. I hoisted Sarah onto my back, her weight shockingly light, and stumbled back towards the trail. Going was agonizingly slow. Lightning flashed, and in those bursts of light, I swear I saw that thing, slinking behind the rocks, always just out of reach. By some miracle, I made it back to my truck as the last light was fading. Got Sarah loaded, radio for help as I tore down the mountain driving recklessly, one hand clamped over the tourniquet to slow the bleeding. The EMTs met me at the trailhead. They took one look at Sarah, then at me. There were questions, but I only half heard them, the world already blurring at the edges. My last clear memory is watching them load Sarah into the ambulance, and the flicker of hope I desperately clung to. Word traveled fast after that. Park was closed, 
Search teams went up Emery, armed to the teeth. They didn't find the girls. Didn't find a trace of the creature either. Sarah, she survived but lost her leg. Can't even imagine what she went through. My statement was dismissed as trauma-induced delusion. Standard protocol, I get that, no matter how much I swear it was real. They quietly transferred me to desk duty. Towns giving me the side eye, tourists too. Everyone thinks I just went crazy out there. Some nights, I almost believe it myself. But then I remember those eyes, that clicking laugh, the smell of rotten meat and something chemical lingering under it. I keep thinking about a story one of the old-timers told me once, about something dark and strange that's been out in the desert longer than any of us. A hunter turned hunted. Laughed it off at the time. Not laughing now. There's a box under my bed. Inside, there's a hunting rifle, high-powered, not standard park issue. I haven't touched it since that day. But lately... I've found myself staring at it more and more. I got the distinct feeling that whatever's out there, it's not done. That maybe this whole thing is far from over. Nights turned into a waking nightmare. I jolt awake, heart pounding, convinced the creature was crouched just outside my window, its hissing laughter echoing in my ears. They offered sleeping pills, gave me a shrink to talk to. Mather helped. My little apartment felt like a trap, the desert beyond a hostile wilderness I couldn't face, but couldn't ignore. Weeks dragged on. Sarah was out of the hospital, learning to navigate life with a prosthetic. I visited her once. The light in her eyes was gone, replaced by a haunted look I knew all too well. We didn't talk about what happened, didn't need to. Turns out, Shared trauma doesn't always forge a bond. Sometimes it just creates a chasm between you. Then came the disappearances. Tourists, locals, reports trickling in of people vanishing out in the desert. No trace, no witnesses, nothing like the attack on Sarah and the girls. Too clean, too, intentional. The park officials downplayed it, blamed the heat, careless hikers. Deep down, I knew they didn't believe that any more than I did. One sweltering afternoon, I sat in a dusty, deserted parking lot at the edge of the park, the rifle lying heavy across my lap. I'd quit the service, no point pretending anymore. Town was practically a ghost town anyway, fear hanging heavier than the heat. The waiting felt endless. When the shadows finally began to stretch... I knew it was coming. A prickle at the back of my neck. That same animal instinct that had saved my life up on Emery Peak. I got out of my truck, rifle at the ready. The creature rose from the brush at the edge of the clearing. Moonlight gleamed on its skin, outlining the unnatural angles of its form. Those terrible eyes locked onto mine and its fang mouth twisted into that sickening mockery of a smile. It let out a hissing laugh that sent shivers down my spine. This wasn't about hunger or territory. There was a cruel intelligence in its gaze. It was enjoying this, savoring the fear. I raised the rifle and fired. The creature jerked, black blood spattering the sand. But it wasn't enough. It lunged, a blur of darkness. The impact knocked me off my feet, a scream tearing from my throat. The hot stink of its breath washed over me, claws raking across my arm, tearing through skin and muscle. Pain consumed me, white-hot and blinding. Then silence. I lay on the ground, gasping, vision fading. The creature was gone. Had it retreated? Was it waiting to finish the job? The trembling wouldn't stop. I fumbled for the first aid kit I kept in my truck. Had to patch myself up. Had to. Had to do what? Run? Even if I could, where? Hide? For how long? 
There was only one thought that cut through the haze of pain and terror. This wasn't just about survival anymore. Not for me. Not for Sarah, or the missing, or for whoever this thing would target next. It was about ending this. The aftermath is a blur. I managed to drive, somehow, back to town. Went to Sarah's place first. Wasn't thinking straight, just some primal urge to warn her, to arm her, to do something. She wasn't there. Found a note stuck to the door, gone up north, staying with family. A flicker of relief cut through the fear. At least she was safe. Next stop was the old ranger station on the edge of town. Place was abandoned, most of the remaining staff relocated after the disappearances. But I knew where they kept the backup armory heavy-duty stuff, the kind they didn't take out on patrol. Broken, alarm warbling futilely against the desert silence. Loaded my pockets with flashbangs, spare ammo. Couldn't carry much more, my wounds were screaming in protest. When I stumbled back to the parking lot, my truck was gone. Clever thing, wasn't it? Knew how us humans thought. Cut me off, strand me. A wave of nausea washed over me, but underneath it, a cold resolve hardened in my gut. It didn't matter. I'd walk if I had to. The desert night was alive. Every rustle, every cry of a night bird seemed to carry a sinister echo. Stumbled along, guided by moonlight and a gut instinct screaming at me to head back towards Emery. There was a reckoning waiting there, I knew it. By the time the first light began to paint the horizon, I'd reached the base of the trail. My legs felt like they would buckle, pain radiating through my entire body. Found a jagged rock, sat for a moment, catching my breath. I loaded the rifle, the motion almost ritualistic. This was where it would end. The creature, or me, may be both. The hike up was a haze of agony. My vision blurred, the world tilting crazily. But I kept going. That damned stubbornness that had saved me before, now driving me to what was likely my doom. There was a strange peace in that, a letting go. Wasn't about fear anymore, hadn't been for a while. It was about rage, and a grief so deep-seated it felt carved into my bones. Reaching the clearing was almost anticlimactic. It lay empty, bathed in dawn light. I stood at the center, rifle held loose at my side. Was it toying with me again? Letting the dread stretch out? Then I saw them. Bodies laid out in a grotesque offering, the missing tourists, the locals. Eyes staring, limbs twisted in impossible angles. And in their midst, Sarah broken and small. Something inside me snapped. With a roar I barely recognized as my own, I charged towards the creature. It materialized from the shadows, hissing in fury. I fired the rifle blind, emptied the flashbangs at its feet. Disorienting bursts of light and noise filled the clearing. And through it all, I never stopped running. I slammed into the creature, tackling it to the ground. We became a tangle of limbs and claws and desperate snarls. Then its claws found purchase, sinking into my side. White-hot pain exploded, but I clung on, fueled by a primal fury. I reached for its face, my fingers finding the hollow of its eye socket. And I gouged. It roared, a terrible sound that echoed through the canyons. Thrashed wildly beneath me, tearing into my flesh with renewed frenzy. But I held on. Pushed my thumbs deeper, felt warm, viscous fluid coat my hands. Finally it went still, an awful, gurgling sigh its last sound. The light faded from its eyes. It was over. How long I lay there, I have no idea. When the rescue team finally arrived, drawn by the gunshots and the creature's dying cries, I was barely conscious. 
The world swam in and out of focus, their faces a blur against the harsh sky. Someone was yelling, something about shock and blood loss, but it all seemed a distant echo. All I could focus on was the creature's carcass, the inky blood pooling in the sand, and Sarah's still form just a few feet away. I had ended it, but the cost, the terrible cost. And with my last ounce of strength, I turned away. Some aftermaths are too painful to witness— My name is Elias Harper, and this happened to me in October of 1994. I work as a park ranger in Mount Rainier National Park. I love to go off trail and explore. It's one of the perks of the job, and I always relish the solitude and the chance to discover pristine corners of my domain. I set off that morning with a destination in mind, Cougar Rock. It's a little-known outcrop and the path leading to it has long been reclaimed by nature. It fit the bill perfectly for a leisurely off-trail trek. The only soul I encountered was old Mrs. Elmsley out walking her terrier. That brief, friendly exchange turned out to be the last human interaction I'd have that day. The hike was invigorating. I reached Cougar Rock just before noon and settled down for a quick lunch. The view was as spectacular as always, and I lingered over a smoke after my sandwich, letting the peacefulness seep into my bones. Reluctantly, I got up and shouldered my backpack. Time to head back. Yet something felt different. The air seemed stiller than before, the silence somehow deeper. I brushed the strange feeling off. I started back on the overgrown path a spring to my step. It was then I saw the first sign. An unusual pile of stones, not a cairn, just messily stacked up. I stopped, puzzled. There was no reason for anyone to place those stones there. I shrugged. Probably kids having some fun. Then something ahead caught my eye. A flash of red amidst the green, a discarded soft drinks can. It marred the untouched feel of the wilderness, and I frowned. People venturing off the beaten path always annoyed me, even if I was guilty of the same. I bent to pick it up, then froze. There was blood on the can. A smear of it, dark and drying. An uneasy feeling washed over me. Had someone hurt themselves out here? Why hadn't they sought help? There was something else on the ground nearby half obscured by leaves, a scrap of dark cloth with a floral print. Fear pricked at the back of my mind. I backed away slowly, eyes searching the trees. Everything looked normal. Still lush and green, the birds chirping as always. But there it was again, a flicker of red between the trunks. I crept forward, heart pounding. A child's backpack lay on the ground, its contents scattered about. A half-eaten bag of gummy bears spilled out onto the leaves, an incongruously cheerful sight in the midst of my growing dread. There was no sign of its owner. A loud crunch behind me. I spun around, drawing my sidearm in one smooth movement. Nothing. Just the forest. The hair on my arms prickled. Was someone, or something, playing games with me? Hello? Anyone there? I shouted. My voice sounded small against the vastness of the trees. No answer, only that oppressive silence. I decided to make a beeline for the trail. No point playing cat and mouse in this maze of branches, not alone, not unarmed. I'd call it in, get a search party back here. As I moved, I could swear I heard the soft pad of footsteps just behind me, muffled by the undergrowth. I whirled around again, but nothing. My mind swirled with horrible possibilities. 
There were plenty of missing persons cases in the park over the years, adults and children alike. Had I stumbled across something grim? Or was this something else? I didn't believe in the stories, the hushed whispers around campfires about strange creatures lurking in the depths of the forest, but fear doesn't care much about logic. Reaching the official trail felt like a victory. I nearly sprinted towards the parking lot, glancing over my shoulder every few seconds. The gnawing sense of being watched never lessened. Reaching my truck felt like the best moment of my life. I jumped in, slammed the door shut, and locked it. Staring out at the empty parking lot, I fumbled for my phone, hands shaking. Then I saw movement, a dark shape slipping between the trees, heading back the way I had come. I blinked, and it was gone. There was only the forest. But I knew. There was something out there, something big, something dangerous, something hungry. And I was no longer alone. My report painted a bleak picture, a missing child, likely abducted. The search went into full swing the next morning. Teams descended upon the park, combing the area around Cougar Rock. I led one of the teams, my stomach churning with dread, knowing that we were probably too late. For days, we found nothing. No trace of the little girl, no clues hinting as to her fate. I couldn't sleep. The image of her backpack lying amongst blood-splattered leaves haunted my dreams. And always, the feeling that those unseen eyes were still watching me, taunting me from the shadows. Then came the break we all desperately needed, a grim one. A hiker on a remote trail found a child's shoe, torn and muddy. It was the same bright pink as the one I'd spotted scattered among the gummy bears. Fear turned to icy determination. We had at least a general area to focus on. The search intensified, with helicopters buzzing overhead and the whole damn National Guard arriving to supplement our numbers. Days turned into a blur of exhaustion, of trampling through thick undergrowth, of peering into the dark crevices between tree roots. It was on that fifth grueling day that I saw it again, the flicker of movement, the hulking shapes slipping between the trees. I charged after it, fueled by a mix of rage and desperation. The terrain was rough, the vegetation thick, but I pushed on. I stumbled, I fell, I cursed, but kept moving. And then, there it was in front of me. It was massive, easily twice my size. Its fur was matted and filthy, its eyes yellow and glowing with a malevolent light. Its teeth, bared in a snarl, were long and dagger-like. The sheer wrongness of the thing, the fact that it shouldn't exist yet somehow did, sent a primal scream up my throat. I fired in a panic, the gunshots echoing through the trees. One bullet hit its shoulder eliciting a roar of pain and fury. It lunged at me. I threw myself back, out of reach of its monstrous claws. The impact with the ground knocked the wind from my lungs. I scrambled back, eyes locked on the creature. It was moving slowly now, blood trickling from its wound. I realized it was hurt, maybe badly. A surge of hope ignited within me but then it changed direction. It turned and shambled away into the trees. My voice was a hoarse rasp. Follow it! Call in the helicopter! We hunted for hours, tracking the creature's bloody trail. It led us deeper into the forest, into parts of the park I'd never even heard of. Eventually, the trail led to a cave, a yawning maw in the mountainside. The bloodstains ended at the entrance. We regrouped at the cave mouth, armed to the teeth. We waited for the helicopter to arrive, its rotors thundering, its searchlights slashing through the gloom. When it finally did, we cautiously ventured inside, senses on high alert. The cave stank of rotten meat and something muskier, more primal. 
The floor was littered with bones, some too small for comfort. In the far back, illuminated by the helicopter's beam, lay a pile of clothing. The little girl's bright pink dress stood out like a beacon. That's when the creature chose to attack. It burst from a side tunnel, a blur of fury and claws. We opened fire, the gunshots deafening in the confined space. I saw it go down under the hail of bullets, the ground around it turning slick with blood. Yet, even as it finally lay still, I looked into those monstrous eyes and saw no surrender, no fear. It died hating us, and I knew deep down its kind would not rest. We never found the little girl's remains. We filled in the cave, burying the creature along with the shreds of the child's belongings. The official report listed her as dead, presumed victim of a bear attack. The truth, of course, was far more terrifying, far too impossible for anyone to believe. I stayed on at Mount Rainier for a few more years, always vigilant, a loaded shotgun a constant companion on even the shortest hikes. But thankfully, I never encountered another creature like it. Perhaps it was the last of its kind. Perhaps not. Even now, years later, retired to a quiet cabin on the other side of the country, I sometimes wake in a sweat, remembering those glowing eyes and that feeling of being relentlessly hunted. They say the park rangers always try to cover things up, that there are far more strange and unexplained deaths than ever reach the public. I couldn't say for sure. But I do know this. There are things out in those wilds beyond our understanding, creatures that lurk unseen just on the edge of our vision. And sometimes, just sometimes, we cross their path. And the aftermath is always tragic. My name is Caden Shaw and this happened to me in October of 2014. I was a rookie ranger back then, fresh out of training, full of ideals and eager to protect the pristine wilderness of California's Yosemite National Park. Now, when people say Yosemite, they think of Half Dome, El Capitan, crowded trails with tourists snapping selfies. But I was assigned patrol in the park's remote northern section, an area most visitors never even knew existed. It was late in the season, fall colors already ablaze on the higher slopes, and a crispness hung in the air. I loved the solitude, the feeling of being so small against the vastness of the mountains. My shift went smoothly, trail maintenance, checking on campsites, the usual routine. I'd always been the outdoors a type, never minded being alone. But as twilight fell and the forest grew dim, a prickle of unease started down my spine. It wasn't rational. There hadn't been a bear incident in this part of the park in years. Just a strange feeling of being watched. I tried to shake it off, telling myself it was nerves. Around sundown, as I was finishing my radio check-in for the night, I stumbled upon it. A half-eaten elk carcass lay in a small clearing. No huge surprise, but what was strange was its placement. It looked almost dropped to the ground, with no sign of a struggle. I reported the find to HQ and waited for backup. Procedure was procedure, even this far out. Night fell quickly in the mountains. As the temperature dropped, I got to work setting up a makeshift perimeter around the site hoping to at least preserve some evidence before the scavengers moved in. That's when I saw the eyes. Two glowing orbs, high off the ground, peering at me from the darkness at the edge of the trees. My first thought was a mountain lion. But this thing looked far too tall, its form elongated and skeletal. A cold dread settled over me. Backup wouldn't arrive until sunrise and I was alone with whatever creature was out there. My voice was shaky as I radioed in the update, 
trying to keep my tone professional. They sounded skeptical, but the protocols were clear. A ranger potentially in danger meant immediate action. It took them hours to reach me. I spent the night huddled near a crackling fire, trying to stay alert and fighting back the waves of nausea that came with the growing terror. Dawn finally broke, and when my backup team arrived, their faces were grim. The elk carcass was gone, not a scrap of bone or fur left. HQ radioed a stern warning, instructing me to fall back, that a specialized team was coming in to secure the area. Specialized for what? I didn't dare ask. Later, I heard whispers among the other rangers, mangled animal remains, hikers disappearing without a trace. I pieced it together. There was something dangerous out there, something the Park Service wasn't sharing with the public. Then came my official debrief. My report was rewritten, my words sanitized and molded to fit the official narrative, likely a cougar attack, further investigation inconclusive. My eyes, usually my most trusted instrument, were dismissed as unreliable at night. I was handed a form and politely advised to take some personal leave. They never said the words, but I knew what they were thinking, traumatized greenhorn spooked by the dark. Maybe part of me wanted to believe that, too, but deep down I knew what I'd seen. The creature materialized a few nights later. They told me to bunk at the Tuolumne Meadows Ranger Station until the investigation was over, but I wasn't about to be cooped up like a spooked animal. It was late. I was tossing and turning in the small cabin when I heard the sound of dry leaves crunching outside right underneath my window. Then a scratching, like long, bony fingers scraping against the wood. There was a putrid, sickly sweet smell in the air. I knew it was right outside the window. I bolted from the cabin, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. Headlamps from other rangers' quarters snapped on, men shouting as they emerged to see what the commotion was about. The creature was gone. They found me shaking uncontrollability, babbling something about glowing eyes and impossible creatures. The next morning, I had my resignation letter on my supervisor's desk. He didn't even try to change my mind. In the years since, I've drifted aimlessly. I stay away from the mountains now, mostly stick to big, crowded cities where it's easy to get lost. Every so often... I see the news reports, hikers gone missing, the same eerie lack of evidence, the same dismissals by officials. I know they're out there, more than one of them now. Hunted by something that defies explanation, the weight of knowing what no one else believes has become my own private hell. One day, a few months ago, I was working an odd job in a small Wyoming town, loading crates in a warehouse. I glanced outside and I froze. Across the dusty street, under a flickering streetlight, was a thin, hunched silhouette. For a moment, the figure turned, and its eyes, those same, chilling, glowing eyes, met mine. It vanished into the night as quickly as it appeared. My resignation to that Wyoming company didn't even raise an eyebrow. Word on the street is there's been some trouble up in Glacier National Park lately a few missing persons, the whispers of a creature stalking the backcountry. I've been considering a trip up north. It's crazy, I know, but every night I lie awake, the image of those eyes burned into my brain. Sometimes the hunted has to become the hunter. I can't spend the rest of my life as prey.